Opposite St Paul's Cathedral in the heart of London, an extraordinary transformation has been taking place over the last six years. Britain is about to get a major new art gallery, Tate Modern, that will rival Paris or New York. But it will be in a building, Bankside Power Station, that many people find harsh and forbidding. Next month, when the first visitors walk down the huge ramp into this new gallery, the Tate hopes that they will gasp at the scene that opens before them. Like a huge indoor street, the Turbine Hall, as it's called, soars a hundred feet into the air. And behind the bay windows, there are several floors of galleries where the Tate will have on show as much art as they already display at their Millbank site. Inside, the Tate has arranged its displays in a way that is entirely new, a complete break from the chronological arrangement of many art galleries. Works from both ends of the 20th century are hung side by side. Above all, the Tate and its architects have created space for art. Some rooms have only a few works in a space that could take a dozen or more. The story of how Tate Modern became the showcase it is today stretches back over six years with almost a thousand people playing a part. Behind every wall, column, window and door, there's a story of hard-fought decisions as the creative vision of the architects met the tough demands of the Tate schedule and budget. We don't fill the gap because we will have unsealed boards and the mastic or uh, the silicon would bleed out into these unsealed floors. I, I wish to have no gap. In my, my, my Technically it's not possible. Ah. The wooden floor again uh, needs to be... We must hit the dates for the balcony glazing. When are they due to have the panels? Now. And where but are they? They're made, they're in Austria, they can't find them. Well, what are they doing about it? They're remaking them. You can't, we can't legislate for, for things that have been made and then are lost. This there is going to be here for how many years? It doesn't matter, Harry. It won't be there at all if we don't do it to budget. No building is ever perfect and you're going to have to live with the imperfections. We're just wasting time and money sitting here talking about it. For example, this whole issue about the shop. I really think if this is the future of museums, I'm not interested anymore. The tension has been high, as over the last six years, the ambitions of the Tate and its architects have come up time and again against the obstacles of budget and schedule. The new gallery cost about £130 million, £50 million of it from the National Lottery. It will give London a major modern art museum and could bring two million or more people a year to this neglected corner of London. For the Tate, the new museum has been an ambition for over 10 years. They were running out of space at their London gallery on Millbank. Here they had British art of the last 400 years and international modern art side by side as uncomfortable neighbours. Only 10% of the collection is on display. 
the rest, including many masterpieces, is in storage. Sir Nicholas Sorota is director of the Tate and a prime mover behind the Bankside project with the support of the Tate trustees. For the last six years, the building has taken an increasing amount of his time as he has angled for money, chosen the architect, worried about schedule and budget, and helped to devise a new way to display modern art. He has been very much a hands-on client as he worked with architects, construction managers and his own staff to get the museum the way he wanted it. We don't want to put the lights on all the time. That doesn't mean to say that they have to be chocolate. And only ask someone for a million pounds or more. We've said right from the outset, we cannot do it. But of course, Sorota wasn't alone. A team of Tate staff, along with construction managers and advisors, has dealt with a series of challenges and obstacles that have threatened the success of the project, at a time when other Millennium projects were falling behind or overspending. Converting an old building might not seem particularly adventurous from a patron of modernism like the Tate. But over the course of five years, they and their architects have created a design style for the new art gallery that still pays its respects to the old power station, opened by the Queen in 1962. The Queen learned some interesting facts about the country's supply of electricity at the National Control. It's at Bankside, on the site of the historic Globe Theatre of Shakespeare's day, since when things have changed. For 30 years or so, a fraction of the life it will have under the Tate, the building generated power for London and the national grid. Giles Gilbert Scott, the architect, believed that industrial buildings should still have decorative elements, as in Bankside's criss-cross roof lights, tall cathedral-style windows, and even the generous use of space above the turbine hall's heavy generators. Even its location seemed extravagant for a power station, right in the heart of London. But Bankside wasn't the Tate's only candidate. They'd looked at a number of sites within a couple of miles of Millbank, including Bankside, whose chimney is just visible from the Tate's roof. Something pricked in my ears and I was going home late one evening and I decided I'd go and have another look at Bankside. Got down onto the riverfront and suddenly realised that this was an extraordinary building. And then I thought, well, how big is it? And it's actually very difficult to judge the scale. So I started at one end and I walked 200 feet and got to the end of one wing. And then I walked another 100 feet which is the centre of section, and so the whole thing was 500 feet long. And then I worked out how big it was, trying to work out how big it was in relation to the Tate itself. And then it occurred to me that if I was in Frankfurt or Cologne and saw this building and was told that it was being converted to be a museum of modern art, I wouldn't be surprised. It was the fact that somehow a grand project of this kind should be conceived for London. The Tate was enthusiastic about the industrial origins of the power station, reflected in the rusting boilers, defunct turbines and cracked windows. But how could they modernise the building and yet keep that sense of history? The issue will be whether we can maintain that sense, not of cobwebs quite, but of a building which is nevertheless not just an industrial relic, but is exciting to visit in its own right. Um, because I mean, on one hand, I'm talking about a, an aesthetic which is pretty rarefied. And you might say a large part of the public coming to the Tate might not even recognise it and will just see the dust on the ledges, as it were. We've got to find a way of making sure that what we feel about that building is conveyed to those people who perhaps haven't encountered that aesthetic previously. 
The world has seen several new art museums open in the past few years, designed from scratch by world-class architects. The new Tate would be seen as competing with the new Guggenheim in Bilbao or the new Getty in Los Angeles. Both of these were designed by architects who were able to start with a blank slate and produce dramatic and distinctive structures. So the Tate's decision to go for a conversion of a distinctly low-key building was a surprise to the architectural world. Everybody's instincts originally, I'm sure, were for building a new building. I mean, it seems to make sense. You want to build a museum of modern art, you want a new building. And of course there was a worry that if you didn't build a new building, everybody would say, oh, come on, it's never going to be as good. I would much have preferred originally the idea that it was going to be a wholly new building. And I fully expected that it was going to be until we went to see Bankside. I mean, I know that there are a lot of people, and I understand this criticism, have been upset that we're not doing a building from scratch. But had we done a building from scratch, the size of that building would have been, I think, something like a quarter of the space capabilities of this building. Once the Tate committed to Bankside, it held an international competition to find an architect. They had a short list of world-class architects, including some very distinguished firms. But Sorota was less interested in big names than in a vision that would work in Bankside. One of the entrants was Jacques Herzog from the Swiss firm Herzog & Demeron. And during the final stages of the competition, he described their approach to the project. We know that there is not enormous sums of money, so the program is very large. So we try to really work with the building, with the existing structures, to take the maximum out of what is here, so that we don't have to exchange and destroy everything. So we want to keep as much as possible. Also as much of quality as possible. The brick masonry, the steel framework, and to add things to that not to decorate it. Our project is very bold, very simple, very strict, and follows the character of the building, I think, in such a way. To nearly everyone's surprise, it was Herzog and his partners who won the competition, beating much better known architects. They were surprised too. They were generally known for much smaller buildings a signal box, a herbal sweet factory, an artist's workshop, an apartment house. The partners in the firm were all young and Jacques Herzog was the principal partner on the Tate's project. He's in his mid forties, so still needs to prove them himself. You know, uh, architects at least until 55, often till 60, consider themselves young. Well, the whole idea about choosing an architect who is in, in mid-career and in mid-40s is, is that we wouldn't get solutions that have been developed in other buildings and be applied to the Tate. And their practice was young too. A dozen or so architects, some straight out of university, with work practices that many young British architects would envy. I see in England people have very often sandwiches and that's a cultural phenomenon. I wouldn't say they should do this or that. I personally wouldn't like staying in the office and having sandwiches. I think it's terrible to do that. I think this is really, um, I think it's very good for your, the brains, for the body to go out, to move a bit and you know to forget about something and to come again and to concentrate on eating and not on working. The Tate wasn't a normal client and often expected the unexpected. In Herzog and de Meuron, they found themselves with architects who were to puzzle and infuriate them over the next five years. The Tate's director of buildings, Peter Wilson, got on well with Harry Gugger, the day-to-day -day architect on the project. But Wilson's liking for Gugger was to be severely tested as the architects fought to maintain their unique vision.
The Tate had started out unsure of how to reconcile the origins of Bankside with its future use. In Herzog, they found someone who might know how to do that. One of the things that drew us to their scheme was the realisation that what they wanted to do was not to preserve in the sense of maintaining heritage, but to preserve in the sense of there being a building that was recognised ha as having had a life and having had a memory. And that they wanted on the one hand to do that, but then to introduce these new elements and create a tension between the original and the new. Well, Jacques Herzog came up with a very simple approach, rational approach to the building, which is you divide it up so that everything between the turbine hall and the river is galleries, three floors of them. Some of them get top light, some of them have side light, very straightforward. The fact that we use the turbine hall as a grand open public space, that's a basic thing. You go into the turbine hall before you go into the museum. We have this big ramp which gives access to this new space because we go down underground, more or less. Then we have this big light element, this big glass element, which is a um, horizontal piece equivalent to the vertical existing chimney. So it's very simple, maybe too simple for many other architects. I thought they would have to change more and to add more and whatever. As Herzog and de Meuron embarked on detailed design, in the power station itself, a unique demolition process was getting underway. Before construction could begin, the power station had to be stripped of every element connected with its old job of generating power. Demolition may sound easier than construction, but it was actually a very difficult task. What we have to remember is, although we're taking away all this these large engineering structures, we have to keep the fabric of the building totally intact. So it's a dismantling job rather than a demolition job, which makes it more dangerous, really, because there are more men working at height, fiddling about. It wasn't just the fabric of the building that had to be kept intact. There was a lot inside that the Tate wanted to keep and that made the job more difficult. People are not used to demolishing power stations and having people still love the interior. And so we are, we, we are intimately involved in getting them to do things the way we want them done, but still at a, a reasonable price. It was an arduous nine months during 1995. Because the demolition team wanted to keep a lot of the walls intact, they made one large hole through which most of the old generating equipment had to be removed. The Tate had told Southwark that they would try to minimise disturbance for the local residents during the demolition. But you can't dismantle this sort of equipment quietly. The PECA machine, which is breaking out the concrete, you know, is, uh, is actually issuing sort of several multi-ton thrusts per second. And, and that sort of thing is needed because something like the concrete blocks where the, the turbine generators stood are made of extremely hard concrete and it's the only way to do it short of explosives and explosives are 
explosives have positively been excluded from the contract because of the vicinity of the, of the work. As the demolition team worked outwards from the core of the building, they had to call for the help of divers to seal a network of tunnels and pipes that ran from the power station under the ground. Some of them brought oil into the power station, others carried Thames water for cooling. The divers will have to work their way under the riverbed through murky water to block off the pipes. Roger that. Slack the diver! You got slack, Greg. Yeah, Roger. Is that you going in the tunnel? Roger, I'm going to move up to the uh, Roger. Roger, let me know when you're at the deepest depth and I'll go for a new mo. Uh, this involves actually fitting a, a shutter to retain the silt so that we continue dredging the material out of the tunnel going towards the penstock chamber up near the power station. They'll be filled the, uh, with the grout. The It'll be a grout fill. Just... Roger. Yeah, roger that. You're going to start moving the bags backwards and forwards. Roger. Okay, mate. Yeah, it's the, the grout material there is to actually cause a seal. Or, and also, you're taking the material seal out, which is a, has a toxic methane buildup in the future. So it's just something they've picked up in the past, like a blind man's sense. Just basically, you get used to putting something down and picking it up without looking at it. By January 1996, it's possible to begin to see what Bankside might become. At the west end of the building, a ramp will bring visitors down into the turbine hall. The boiler house on the right has now been emptied of several floors of equipment. On this spot will rise a shop with a cafeteria above it, and above that will be three floors of galleries. But at the moment, it requires some imagination to see anything here but dust and rust and rubble, the hallmarks of a disused power station. Somehow, Herzog and de Meuron's design had to overcome the building's natural disadvantages. It's not the most elegant building. It's uh, rather crude in some of its uh, mass and f volumes. I mean, it's, you know, two big chunks with one sort of big thing sticking in the middle of it which reflects exactly what it was all about. Um, some of its detailing and some of its brickwork is quite nice, but that doesn't turn me on. Fortunately, since there was so much of it, the brickwork did turn Jack Herzog on. The brick expresses something which is traditional and also very modern because it still is a very good building material. One decision that had to be made early on was whether to clean the building or not. But there were problems if they did, and problems if they didn't. I mean, the first immediate response to the building is scrub it down, make it clean and shiny, and it'll be bright and beautiful. You're going to wash away a certain sense of the patina of history. Now, on the other hand, at the moment, its message is somewhat gloomy, austere, dirty. Um, how do we strike a balance between those two? And it's a at this moment, we don't have, a, don't have a solution. There's a danger that we'll get the whole thing so cleaned up that it'll no longer be the building that we wanted, or that we saw, or that we were inspired by. For Herzog, less is more when it comes to cleaning the brickwork. I would like to leave it as it is, because um, the building has been done in several stages, and it's not the same brick, and if you clean it, you get aware of these different colors. It will not be nicer, so why should we clean it? I would prefer leaving it as it is. In March 1997, the design team met to try to make a decision. In some way, I think it's insane to clean a building. So we take 
everything out of the building inside. The, you know, all the machinery and then all the, the technical thing. And I think cleaning it would even, you know, make it thinner, you know, visually. If we do clean it, it will look like cardboard architecture. That's what I feel. If you look at what happened to the V&A, mm. when they cleaned the V&A, it just became a facade, a very thin facade, like a veneer on the building. The meeting continues on the roof. Part of the problem is that Bankside itself was built at different periods of different bricks. And there was also the need to repair some areas with new brick, with a colour as near as they could get to the old. The colour of the new brick is so pink and red, even if you clean this, you don't, don't get anywhere near the colour of that new brick. So you're still going to get the contrast. Well, I'm pretty sure after five years' time, this has been come with quite close. Quite close. Oh, you think? Yes. I, I don't think. think. Yeah, I think. So the, the, the question is less about cleaning the old, but making the yeah. new a bit... A bit, um, bit more weathered. A bit more... You think so? You think so? It'll soon weather. This looks, this looks better after a month than it did six <laughs> weeks ago. It's true. It was much brighter when six weeks ago. We've done brick. Yeah, we've done brick, yes, yes, yes. We've decided not to nip and tuck this building. Yeah, no, no face lifts at this stage. It's too young. The brick discussion was the first of many where Herzog and de Meuron resisted the idea of interfering with the old building if they could possibly avoid it. They were determined to respect the overall approach adopted by Giles Gilbert Scott. He used the brick like it would be a tissue, like it would be a, a cloth for the steel frame. And um, once you start uh, uh, working on the elevations, you, it, it's like you would hurt the, the building. It's like it would, uh, there, it would start bleeding. This is the big challenge, I think, that we want to keep the building, we want to keep its expression, but still we have to do something with it. And it's very, it's very difficult. Of course, there also had to be many new elements in the museum. The boiler house would carry the galleries and public spaces, a building within a building. As the team gathered to look at the architect's initial designs for the gallery spaces, it became clear that Herzog and de Meuron needed monitoring, since they'd never designed a major art gallery before. Have the collection services okayed having doors that are only three metres high? How high is the lift? Higher. Higher. So what is the purpose of having a high lift and a low door? Good question. It, I mean, I can think of plenty of sculptures in the Tate that won't go through that door. Yeah, there are plenty. In terms of height. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, oh and, some of, and, some of, and some of them, quite a number of them are pieces that you would want to keep upright, like mm -hmm. Gill's Mankind. Yeah. There are a substantial number of objects that won't th fit through a door like that. Right. It's the balance to be struck between an opening that's ideal for taking a big piece in and out and a door that looks right, isn't it? I do think that three metres is quite tight for big pictures. Forget the sculptures. There are, and I'd like to know how many objects there are in the collection mm -hmm. that We've have dimen to yeah, so dimensions that are more than three metres in two, di in two directions. Shark, is your preference for three metres absolute at all doorways? No, no, of course or not. No, no, is it no, no it, it, as Nick says, I think we need a list. And, and it's clear that if the Tate has a great number of objects that wouldn't go mm. through, n not even in the, in the diagonal, we, we yeah. need to rethink that. And, and, mm. and, and There were certain principles that Herzog believed in that were to crop up time and again in the design of Tate Modern. One of them was that the gallery spaces should be simple and uncluttered. Any technical equipment should be as invisible as possible. We don't like to see, you know, intake grills or outlet or you know, air supply or cameras or sprinklers or... I mean, there's so many things, you know, which are very active visually. Can't we have the camera and the, all these other things this together? Is, this is as, a little, as a little still life, at least, or something. If they have and not too many well, things this spread is not around. Very easy to achieve. So that anything which takes your attention away from 
the piece of art um, disturbs me. Because today, more, many artists are dealing with things like grills or let's say signals with you know these running men saying this is the emergency exit these are this is very often part of what is art today contemporary art can come in all shapes and sizes and is as likely to be on the floor as on the walls so the architects and the Tate wanted the simplest possible setting for the displays but because of the air conditioning system they'd chosen, they also needed floor grills. The floor and the junction with the walls are very critical in display terms. And to um, have a very simple space, which we want, means that it's not a good idea to have lots of grills at floor level. Uh, and the difficulty, which was really one that I found my, myself and the engineers on one side of a, a debate and the curators and the architects on the other, was how could we do this um, when we were trying to produce this very simple, cool, sophisticated um, approach to a display space. But floor grills there had to be, even if the architects hated the idea. If you have grills everywhere, you know, it's like you, you have the impression that you stand on some technical um, installation, you know. And it also is a problem as soon as an artist like Carl Andre puts some sculpture, his sculpture, or Richard Long on one of the, about spreads it over these floor grills, you know. And it wasn't only the architects who were unhappy about the grills. The senior curators hated the way that such prominent features could get in the way of art. I continue to be worried about the grills on the floor and how they will look and how they will determine what we can put where, especially in terms of sculpture. But the curators lost the fight against grills. And since the galleries had to have them, the Tate and the architects decided to make them look as if they were a leftover from the old power station. In order to convince ourselves and our curatorial colleagues that uh, there was a strategy that would make the, a design strategy that would make the grills less uh, obtrusive, um, we hit upon this notion that they've got to be heavy and substantial. What else can I do? We have to have grills, they have to be a certain size, and we've come up with a pragmatic solution. I'm still worried about how it would look. We had worries, but now I think it's, um, we are in a very, uh, we've found a very interesting solution with these heavy steel grills, which, um, which are very substantial pieces, and they look like being part of the building. You know, many people will think this was, um, there already, and so it doesn't catch so much attention. Over the years of design and construction, the theme of the building's colour was to emerge time and time again. There were constant worries among the Tate team about whether Tate Modern would look too gloomy if the architects had their way. In a corner of Bankside, several elements of the turbine hall design are mocked up for the Tate team to approve. With monotonous regularity, one colour keeps coming up time and again. So black concrete walls. So the black concrete on the two sides. Why are we having black concrete on the walls? We always wanted to have it black throughout. This is black concrete. It's so shiny black. There are two versions of black concrete. This is one of them. So are the steels black or dark grey? The team still has to agree a colour for the vast area of wall that divided the turbine hall from the boiler house. When you're standing in the turbine hall, you'll have this sense of a solid wall, but within it openings that actually let on not to gallery spaces, but to social spaces, spaces where people are in movement or resting. Herzog and de Meuron's first suggestion for treating the wall had worried the Tate team. Herzog wanted black brick, and that started a debate about colour that became almost theological in its subtleties. When he first proposed it, um, I think we were all somewhat horrified. The thought of this massive black, black surface 
Um, he did a search for the sort of brick that he thought would be appropriate, couldn't find it, and then modified his thinking. And that's very much the kind of way he works. I don't think we're on black now, we're on some shade of grey. I think it has to be a positive tone, in the sense that I think it shouldn't be white, and I don't think it should be a light grey. Um, it needs to be lighter than the steelwork. And if it is lighter than the steelwork, then it will appear lighter than it perhaps is. I mean, the architects are happy with darkness. Absolutely. And the Tate aren't. Yes. Uh, I, th I, think, I think that represents the, the poles, but I don't, I don't see it quite as uh, black and white as that. <laughs> Sorota is shown a mock-up of the architect's suggestion for the turbine hall wall. He is horrified. On a dull grey day in, in April, Never mind January. It's going to be too dull. It really is. We don't want to put the lights on all the time. It's just too. It's just too oppressive. You're really saying immediately this is nothing more than a real industrial space. At the moment, we have a grey concrete floor in the turbine hall. We have a very dark steel skeleton structure and a lighter grey on the walls. We have glass, we have certainly visible as you come in areas of wooden floor. So that's all a fairly <coughs> neutral palette, although the warp, warp, some warmth will come from the wooden floor. Then there's the question about how you play with colour beyond that. I mean, I, I know for instance the staircase has always been described as black, but actually the staircase is a is a very important signal of communication through the building. If you make it black, um, you're actually taking blackness right the way through the building in a certain way. Painting steel with a strong color is very problematic. We're all very familiar with this building. And one of the things that happens when people come in is, especially when they come into the turbine hall, for the first time, there is this incredible sense of a wow factor. But it's quite clear from the reaction to the images that we've been showing people that there's also a feeling that people are beginning to have that this is a very bombastic building and that it's a very masculine building. But, but there's a danger, and I say it's only a danger, that this will be seen as a sort of almost fascistic sort of feel to it. And I'm picking that up from quite a lot of people, and it worries me deeply, actually, at the moment. During 1996, while Sorota is worrying about important design issues, there are two other areas of concern that will become increasingly important, fundraising and construction. Why is it frustrating, Ian? What's the the Tate team that assembles at Christmas is encouraged to air their worries, and Sorota expresses a few of his own. Our success in persuading the world that this is going to happen and that it is going to open in May 2000 has, is becoming a powerful impediment to us raising the funds that yes. will make that a reality. There are lots of people yes. walking around London who are capable of giving us large sums mm -hmm. of money who believe that they don't have to because we've already raised the money and it's a dead cert that this will happen. Um, and we have to find some way of shaking their confidence. But not too much. But not too much. I think the volunteers who have to go out and ask people for the money um, have been extraordinarily committed and conscientious in doing that. Yeah. And I think also courageous, because I don't think it's actually very easy. It's, it's quite difficult to, to be in a position where you can only ask someone for a million pounds or more, which is the position that all our volunteers have been in at the moment. They've not been talking to anyone who offers them less than a million pounds, and that's a difficult thing to do. Ian Blake, from a company called Shall, has been appointed as construction manager. The architects are behind with the design, and Blake has to point out to the team that he is still waiting for any construction to manage. He is a very worried man. From where I'm sitting, the building design continues to change. We haven't finalised sufficient elements of the building that we should have done. We're going out to serious tender in the new year, the information isn't there necessarily as it should be, and I want to start on time, and it's, it's a big worry. Certainly, 
uh, we've reached a, a milestone or a crossroads in the job now where um, you know that we simply can't change anything anymore. We can't go uh, go back and, and sit in our offices and, and think too much about things uh, that can happen in the future. We need to have, have a clear, clear uh, understanding of the key issues and, and way forward. And okay, we may come up with some brilliant ideas, which would have been great. Unfortunately, it's just too late. Part of the dilemma faced by Blake was the fact that as Herzog and de Meuron's ideas evolved and put pressure on the schedule, they were supported by Sorota as he saw the building becoming better and better. Play with that in terms of how dominant those become. Every time Jacques and Harry touch the building in one way or another, it becomes denser, more complex, richer, and fundamentally more exciting for the potential visitor to the gallery. In fact, I know that he likes that when we are pushing the design forward because he is the same and uh, he's, uh, he's uh, never happy. Uh, he's someone who tries to go another step uh, in very difficult situations. I don't want to design them, but yeah, I do want to design them. <laughs> I can see a space where they would. He made an important contribution to the design, I think having all these meetings with him and that we dared to do another step each time was also because he supported us. We didn't choose an architect um, on the basis that they would deliver us uh, a project without bothering us in the meantime that was um, finished on time and on cost and was uh, uh, no, no trouble to us. It's not that they are loose cannon, it's just that they are, they are creative people and they want to consider things. The trouble was, every time Herzog and Gaga considered things, it led to a change in the design. There were a series of milestones called design freezes, which the architects consistently failed to meet. We find ourselves now, in the early part of January 97, um, where some aspects of uh, design freeze 4 and 5 unfortunately have not been cleared, and it means that we are, in effect, four weeks behind where we wanted to be, but in real terms, it's 12 weeks. We've gone back to where we were a year or so ago. You've got to be pragmatic about it. It's quite hard sometimes, because I share the desire to, um, uh, to play around with things until they're perfect. And one of the hardest rules you have to learn is to accept the kind of 80% rule. What is the 80% rule? That um, it's better to settle for 80% of what you wanted and get it delivered when you wanted it than to wait for 100% delivered at some indeterminate time in the future that might be never. Eventually, increasing concerns about design delays lead the Tate to draw up a public agreement for the whole team to sign. There will now be no more design changes and all the principal partners will work together to get the gallery completed on time and on budget. At least, that's the idea. What I'm used to is the design being finalised at tender stage, you know, let alone you know, halfway through tender. They're actually talking about when something is actually built, um, they may well go back and say they want to change it or knock it down and do it again, it's, which is just sort of mind-boggling. I still can't get, come to terms with that. But in the midst of his frustrations, Blake has to admit that occasionally there are compensations to working with the Swiss architects. Yeah, they're good fun, yeah. especially Harry. I've been at a meeting where he, uh, all of a sudden he sat, he, he sat on his head. Apparently that's yoga or something, I don't know. He just decided he needed to stretch his legs. And I was also at a meeting where, I'll never forget it, where Jacques uh, decided that uh, it was time for him to go for a run along the embankment. And uh, so he did. You know, he did with some strange people, but it um, makes it fun. Building should be fun after all. It's too boring. In the midst of the Tate's worries about the architects staying focused on the job, Jacques Herzog drops a bombshell. He and his partners have accepted an invitation from the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA, to enter a competition to design a new extension for what the Tate sees as a rival museum. You'd, you wouldn't need to be a fortune teller to know that they would be asked, given uh, the profile of our project. I thought, well, as an artist, if you're given an opportunity, if you're offered an opportunity to, of something, an, another wonderful project, it's very, very difficult to say no to it.
Sorota was disappointed and dismayed by Herzog's flirting with MoMA. He wanted all of the architect's attention at a crucial time for the design of Bankside. There was a very difficult moment in January, February, at a moment when it appeared that the design work on our project was beginning to run behind schedule. And I was undoubtedly concerned that if their attention was taken on to the MoMA project, we would suffer even more. Nick's point of view was that it was a, a distraction for Jacques when he ought to be treating our project as the, the one and only great museum project that he was involved with. And uh, Nick also worried that if MoMA chose Herzog and de Meuron, we would be in some way slightly diminished in some respects by the fact that we were the only ones who'd done it. Harry Gugger dismissed the possibility that they might win. We are far away f of uh, being the architects of the MoMA, so we even don't discuss this issue at the moment. On December the 8th, the Museum of Modern Art in New York announced that it had awarded the commission for its new extension to Yoshio Taniguchi, a Japanese architect. I think that we were quite tough on Jacques and Harry when they entered the Museum of Modern Art competition. And in consequence, in the spring of this year, probably got more of Jacques' attention than we might otherwise have done. Is that right? That's a psychological reaction, perhaps, <laughs> to, um, to prove that one is even more... But there are phases where you need to be more present physically as a person than others. We really, now more than before, would want this building to be the best museum in the world. I can only tell you that yesterday afternoon with the trustees, um, I repeated to them that you had said something of this kind and there were peals of laughter. <laughs> As the power station is finally ready for the construction work to begin, the Tate prepares to bury a time capsule in the foundations of the building. The architect has provided us with a piece of Swiss mounting crystal, which um, is going to really give the building good karma, um, in their opinion. The Nix rotor has provided us with his fountain pen. Um, there's all sorts of things, really. It's difficult to remember it all. There's a party tonight to mark the next phase in the project as the Tate prepares to spend £50 million on the construction. But as the great and the good and the rich assemble, Nick Sorota still has fundraising on his mind. He has had two years to raise £130 million, but so far has had a series of rebuffs from donors he hoped would cough up. Um, I think the pressure's on to raise the 25 million to get up to 130. To achieve that, it's going to take another act of persuasion and imagination on my part and one or two other people. And there are people abroad who are beginning to put money in. There are people who live in London who've been coming and having dinners at the Tate for the last 10 years who haven't yet put their hand in their pocket. That's shaming. And I've got to do something about that. In spite of the party mood at the end of 1997, Nick Sorota and the rest of the team knew that they were about to enter the most difficult phase of the project, when they would have to start committing to spend money at a rate of half a million pounds a week. They were determined to stay on time and on budget, but the following year was to bring problems that threatened both those targets.
The choice of an old power station, Bankside in London, to become the Tate's new modern art gallery took many by surprise. I think it's, it's, it's not the most elegant building. It's, you know, two big chunks with one sort of big thing sticking in the middle of it. But the Swiss architects who'd won a competition to convert it liked the building's grimy appearance. In some way, I think it's insane to clean a building. I think cleaning it would make it thinner visually. All through 1996, the architects just kept on designing and redesigning when the construction team were desperate to start. We haven't finalised the building that we should have done, and I want to start on time, and it's, it's a big worry. Now, 1997 is to be full of surprises, good and bad, as the old building reveals some of its secrets to the Tate team. This is the challenge that the Tate is facing in January 1997, to construct seven floors of galleries and public facilities in this huge space, the old boiler house, and to create a vast new lobby in what used to be the turbine hall. For Ian Blake, in charge of managing the construction process, building an art gallery was to be a new experience. We've got some really heavy exhibits. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with what sort of things that Tate display. I mean, they can really display anything from a, from a I don't know, a, a, a grand piano hanging off the wall to, you know, a stuffed giraffe or something. There are all sorts of things that they can, they can display and probably will do. There's £70 million worth of work here and dozens of construction companies waiting to get their hands on it. Tate Modern, as it's called, is a Millennium project, and at a time when other Millennium projects are getting out of control, the Tate wants to come in on time and on budget. If we just take a walk down, trying to do what we need to do in 23 months, doesn't sound very long, does it? If you can imagine taking seven levels up, removing the concrete planks, having to take the parapets on the outside, removing these roof lights, and each, each of which weighs about 7.8 tonnes, so we're going to have to cut those into manageable sections. We've got to lift those off by a crane. Uh, the trusses will have to be removed. And the, whole, the whole building's stabilised. It's quite a prospect. OK, we just continue walking up here. A steady stream of contractors walks through the building, hoping to get a lucrative contract to build new steel or supply the concrete or construct the walls and ceilings. But by the end of 1997, some of the successful bidders were to wish they'd never seen Bankside. The power station was designed in the late 1940s, and Giles Gilbert Scott, the original architect, believed that industrial buildings should still have some character. For the Tate, features like his concrete and glass roof lights are worth keeping. Everybody has been emotionally attached to those roof lights and thought, I really like those roof lights. Is there no way of keeping them? The problem is that um, they're so badly affected by carbonation, chlorination, just about everything else, that, um, that they're not really able to be uh, salvaged. It's now become clear that we cannot retain the existing roof light unless we want to run the risk that in two or three years after the opening of the museum, we would have to close the turbine hall and do major repairs to the roof light. The sudden need to replace the roof lights is the first of several blows faced by the team as construction gets underway. They've not planned for a new roof over the turbine hall, so the architect is told to keep things simple and cheap. I think the architect at the moment is favouring a, a simple glazed, patent glazed system, double pitched. Um, and what he's going to do on the underside is to uh, create this grillage effect, which will double up as a walkway, 
but will somehow preserve the crisscross diagonal appearance that currently exists. Certainly I'd prefer to go that route, um, but then again I'm a Philistine. This off-the-shelf greenhouse is a poor substitute for the original design, but at least the grill underneath helps to hide it. It's diffusing light conditions within the turbine hole, and you don't see what uh, silly uh, double-pitched roof, roof light is up there. I don't think that this solution will be ugly, because the ugly part is hidden. That's the important thing of it, and it might be quite magic. Unfortunately, the roof light problem emerges just as the team are making a few other unpleasant discoveries about the old building. Yeah, I think we should let the whole thing unravel and because then find out what the best the solution is over the whole... Yeah, absolutely. There's a problem potentially with the whole roof. In the 1950s, when the huge boilers were pushing steam through the turbines, asbestos was used as an insulator. Nowadays, a trace of asbestos in the air can shut down a building site. So when the building was handed over to the Tate in 1994, Magnox, the owners, guaranteed to the Tate that the building was asbestos free. But when Ian Blake comes into work one morning in June 1997, he gets an unpleasant surprise. Well, unfortunately today, what we've found is there's a presence of asbestos inside the building. Don't quite know how serious that is. It's come about during the treatment of the existing steelwork where we're blasting away at high level in the turbine hall and it's uh, dislodged um, elements of material that have uh, been encapsulated material and, uh, and clogged behind existing uh, framing at the top of the building. So just as the first major contractors are about to come on site, all activity stops while specialist teams come in and remove the asbestos. It is not a promising start. We've got to get out of this problem very, very quickly. We've, we should have started the substructures by now. We are some um, five weeks away from that taking place. It's not a happy time. Blake and his construction managers work out the delay that will be caused to the project. Now he has to report this to the whole Tate team. But it's a very serious issue and it's... Um, will impact on the job such that at the end of the day I, th I feel there'll be a five-week delay. So it's clearance of asbestos by the end of next week. Yeah. So it's still our <coughs> expectation. There's no reason to revise no, that. No, we're on no. target for that. What that's tied into is the risk which must be associated with not having determined where this has come from. Yeah. Yes. Which is, well, that's the which is obviously a big worry. Are you suggesting, Tony, that the risk is that there is still some up there somewhere that we yeah. haven't spotted yes, and that could come yes, I am. at any point? Yes, I am. A week later, the building is given a tentative all clear and the first contractors are allowed on site. But then the engineers come back with more bad news. They've discovered a type of corrosion in the concrete roof surrounding where the roof lights had been, so that will have to come down too. Having cleared the asbestos, we've now got to take the roof off across the turbine hall. So, you know, it's starting to stack up against us, really, because we'd actually made a good start on the substructures, um, and now we're interrupting that progress. We're starting to eat into continuity, and it's, uh, it's a problem. The concrete problem had been suspected for some time, but the team hadn't wanted to face the possibility that the whole roof would have to be demolished, adding another problem to the list. Uh, the long short of it is, the turbine hall roof was surveyed six times, six areas, and it was a cliffhanger whether it was going to stay or not, and eventually a design team like made a decision that it had to come down, quite late in the day. As the construction team finally sets about removing the roof, the Tate and its Swiss architects are trying to sort out a disagreement with Sir Norman Foster, the distinguished British architect. 
Bankside is just over the river from the city and the Tate had encouraged a competition for a footbridge to bring visitors across the river to the new gallery. The competition was won by Norman Foster and sculptor Anthony Caro, but nobody was very happy with their first design. The end of their bridge would have to land on the Tate's landscape, which would be designed to fit in with the architect's approach to the building, simple and rather spare. So the Tate are not at all happy with Foster and Caro's very sculptural landing. How can they integrate such a large feature into their simple landscape plans? So that I think these are elements are important to enclose this area, but also to have like something with... The landscape design is very linear, with straight hedges and small rectangular clumps of trees. Now they're trying to find a way for the bridge to land without seeming too prominent. Do you think it would be stupid to land in the little forest? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Take out here. Mm -hmm. Yes. The bridge has to rise quite high over the river to allow boats to pass underneath. This means there'd be a big difference in levels if it came all the way down to the Tate's landscape. So the architects propose a solution. We have a little hill, which then uh, helps uh, the bridge uh, to land. So they don't have, with the bridge as an element, they have to overcome all the different in le difference in levels, but they land on the hill and then within the landscape, this landscape element, which is again lawn and trees, you would walk down. Uh, but this has not been discussed, uh, this proposal, uh, so far. Of course, it would have to be discussed with Sir Norman Foster himself. But for a long time, no senior British architects had anything to do with Herzog and de Meuron. I have found it rather strange, actually that this competition ran, uh, the winners were appointed. We're now two years on, and we're arranging for the first time a meeting between Norman Foster and Jacques Herzog. I can't think of any other country in the world where um, the, the profession would have made uh, the winners of a competition of this kind feel so much that they are outsiders. After a couple of meetings with Foster, the Tate architects persuaded the bridge team to make their southern landing smaller. It became what was called for a while the Eye of the Needle, smaller than the first version, but still larger than the Tate liked. But they still have to persuade Foster that it should land on a hill or a mound. Another high-level meeting is organised in October 1997. While Herzog and Sorota are waiting for Foster to appear, they're still unhappy about the current design. Do you think that now that they um, have created this um, needle effect, mm -hmm. an eye of needle, they would want to retain that? Otherwise it could just land in a single exactly. line, exactly. Exactly. which would be better. Exactly. Don't you think? Absolutely. This is just a Absolutely. symbolic... Absolutely. Hello. <laughs> In a very English way, there are no raised voices and an exaggerated politeness, as Foster argues that the bridge should land on a flat landscape, while Herzog sticks to his mound. And the idea we have, which is not shown here, is to create a kind of a mound on which the bridge could land. And this mound is like a leftover from a, from a landscape, which could be irregular, you know? And with this artificial piece of landscape, we can also resolve problems which we have here and here. And, and let, let me just finish. The idea of this little mound would be that you could, coming from the bridge, go down in different directions and not like in the actual state that you come and you need to go back in order to go there, for instance. You know what I mean? So th this, this little slope with trees on it, would give the possibility to go in all directions. Foster decides that it's time to give Sir Rota and Herzog a tutorial in architecture. If you really want an acid test of a tall building, it's the way that it finally connects with the ground. And those buildings which come down on top of podiums, whether it's the post office towers, as it was uh, originally, I think that it, it, it's the same with the bridge. You see that bridge over there. It connects with the hard 
horizontal surface. And every time I feel the need to bring that bridge down positively and to anchor it, the forces which are holding everything back here, I, I feel very unhappy about it sitting on top of, of a mound. It looks as though it's going to be torn off. So every time I feel the... I, I'm very, very unhappy about it dropping down into... Uh, oh, you have Yeah. To. I'm very, very unhappy about this that. Is not, um, this is not the building. Foster shows that he is a man who can say no in a dozen different ways, and all of them polite. I would be less than honest if I said that I didn't have severe reservations about uh, about the core concept there. Um, if you cannot accept the bridge to land on that piece of artificial landscape, we need to rethink that with our landscape architect. It's the, the connection with the ground plane, the destination point. I would find it very, very difficult to design um, something that came down on top of, uh, on top of a mound. Um, I, it's, uh, I find that. Even if it's just, you know, the line, the band, which... In an hour of discussion, the two sides have failed to move from their respective starting points, and time is running out. Keep our thinking caps collectively on. In the end, the mound disappears, one up for Foster, but then so does the needle's eye, so Herzog gets something out of the encounter too. Now that the roof and asbestos problems are sorted out, Shall, the construction managers, move ahead with the largest contract on the project, the complex steel framework that will rise in the boiler house. One of the people who has his eye on this contract is Geoffrey Taylor of Watson Steel in Bolton. Until he saw inside Bankside, he didn't realise quite how much work was involved. I've been in a bigger building than this in my life. <laughs> Do you think? Um, I wouldn't know. Have you? Have you? Have I? Uh, probably not, no. There are going to be large spans supporting, I understand, the enormous sculptures. I mean, I, I don't think uh, Barbara Hepworth and Henry Moore had... Was, it was all holes, you know, I think it's an awful lot of stone and marble. There are five or six companies that could do this work. Um, not as well as we can, of course. One of the other five or six is a company called Rowan Structures. It's an attractive proposition. I've no doubt the Tate won't be short of uh, people wanting to bid it. How many serious competitors do you think there are for you? Good gracious. Any competitor is a serious competitor, and there are a lot of them out there. There's no shortage of steel fabricators. Six months later, Rowan Structures and Watson Steel are both on a shortlist of six. At a bad time for the construction industry, the competing firms know that they have to cut their costs and margins right back to stand a chance of getting the contract, and they don't have much time. Well, the, uh, the tender date is uh, Friday the 13th. It's got to be by 12 o'clock, so <laughs> maybe there's something in that. We're getting to the point when we need a job like this in the next few weeks, and it takes the pressure off, because if we don't get this one, we've then got to concentrate on the next one. As Watson's senior management team gathers to fix a final price for the job, there's little room for manoeuvre. They've estimated all the costs very carefully, but managing director Joe Locke is still worried. My overriding impression is that looks very, very high if we're going to win it. Who's the competition? Well, I think, there's, I think the traditional competition who we've, we've seen at meetings, Hares and uh, Rowan's, must be viewed as, as red-hot competition. Locke is determined to find ways of beating the competition. If the estimate of costs is accurate, there's only one other place to look for cuts, in the profit markup. 
They'd started out hoping to add a modest 5%, but Locke decides to trim it even further. Well, let, let's put 3% on. Agreed? Spit it out if you're not happy. Yeah, I'm just worried about there's no contingency. Everything's stripped out to the bare minimum, isn't there? We've not, we've not got anything in. Right, OK. 3%. Okay. okay. Two days later, the six bids are handed in to Ian Blake at Bankside. Hi, Barry. Oh, here's another one. This uh, should have been delivered to uh, our offices, so I have to take this one across. Watson's bid is lying on the table along with packages from five other companies. Shall are hoping for a final bid that is lower than six and a half million, but are prepared to go up to seven. Ian Blake starts by reading out each company's bottom line. Watson. Elementary, my dear. Six million eighty-five thousand two hundred and eighty-five. This one's from William Hare. Five million four hundred and eighty-nine thousand eight hundred and forty pounds. Rowan. Six million ninety-four thousand one hundred and fifty-four. These three companies are the lowest bidders, and the group now has to read through each proposal in detail to make sure their totals haven't left anything out. The one in the five million range from Hares, I'd suspect at this stage without knowing, I suspect they must have. Um, You've made some qualifications or admitted something, I can't believe that uh, they'd be that far different from the, the mid-range. In final negotiations, Rowan, keen to get the contract, make a rash promise. To do the job in 15 weeks instead of the 20 Shal had expected, and this reduces the cost too. It becomes an irresistible offer and Rowan gets the contract. It looks like a good result. I mean, we're now looking to let this package under six million. We've got a million pounds now that's going to pay for a lot of the problems we're currently experiencing. Friday the 13th was an unlucky day for Watson, but as it turned out, it was also an unlucky day for Rowan and the Tate. Over the next six months, Rowan was to discover that in their eagerness to get the contract, they had cut their costs and timetable too close to the bone and badly underestimated on the job. But for now, with the earlier problems out of the way, it's Ian Blake himself who causes the next upheaval. Shal has been taken over by one of the construction giants and Blake has become increasingly disillusioned with the company, so he resigns. I want to be part of something that's new, different, and going to take the industry to a new dimension, a new level. I basically want to be able to control my own destiny rather than the other way around. A lot of people will, you know, think I'm crazy. This is the probably best project in the country, um, one of the most significant. I've been involved in this particular project two and a half years. I was the first person of our company to set through the doors of Bankside Power Station before the deplanting began. Uh, so I saw it in its total glory. Shal quickly has someone ready to step into his shoes, a New Zealander, Mike O'Rourke. I love construction. Um, two reasons. One is because we're very much a people orientated business. Um, there'll never be robots climbing around scaffolds, laying bricks, so we'll never be automated to the extent that industry is. And the people you come across are just incredible. Um, and the second thing is you, you start with a concept and a big hole in the ground, and one day you walk away and you've actually built something. This is Bankside in August 1997. The first major contractor is about to come on site to create the concrete foundations on which a steel framework will be erected. The company responsible for the concrete work is called Burse, and Paul Hewlett is their site agent. Like most people, when I first came to site and actually viewed the building, 
which was one of the first things I did. I was, I was pretty gobsmacked when you stand on the outside on the viewing galleries looking through it's such a huge space. You take a step back, how are we going to do that? And then once I got into the job and started looking around, I'm pleased to be here. I, I like the building. As a condition of the contract, Bursa's agreed to give jobs to some of the long-term unemployed in Southwark. But I was lucky to get this job because I went to the job centre and everything. And a woman at the job centre, she said to me um, that she's got a nice job for me to do. So she phoned up um, this company and after that, I got the interview and everything's there. Everything was right. The regular Burst team find the job very different from their usual projects. I usually work on motorway bridges and sewage works, that kind of thing. And I've never been on a job where it's just a big base. It's the biggest base I've worked on. It's, uh, I've never seen so much steel. Anybody can work on a motorway bridge, but how many carpenters are going to say that they worked on the Tate Gallery? I can say that. <laughs> the amount of work that's going to go on after we've pulled out, we won't even be able to see what we've done. Nobody will know it's here, it just us. This steel cage of reinforcing bars will provide strength for the concrete. Before it's poured, Burse has to thread pipes, drains and ducts through the space. It's important to get the connections right now. If something goes wrong and the services don't work when the gallery's up and running, there'll be some extremely expensive digging up to be done. This is the east end of the building, and there'll be the same area to fill with concrete on the west. It's one of the biggest foundation jobs in London. Burse has to stick to a very tight schedule, and there's no room for error. Numerous things can go wrong. Things that can go wrong that cost us enormous amounts of money. If we're halfway through the concrete pour and the pump breaks down or the concrete plant breaks down, that's when we have to really kick in. We can't just leave one of these things half done. Concrete has to be handled carefully. It arrives on site in a non-stop stream of trucks, about 50 a day. Then it's pumped 100 feet or more into the building. Graham Bennett is in charge of quality control. He's a man who finds satisfaction in concrete. It's a firm foundation on which to base my life, I believe, yes. And uh, in the short time I've been with the company, I've already had two pay rises. And that compares very favourably with the doll. Or working part-time three pounds an hour as a telesales assistant for a double glazing company. The concrete's poured in sections, with each section separated by wooden shutters. In a working day, they can fill a whole width of the boiler house between dawn and dusk. All goes well till September the 24th. Then, while the concrete is solidifying, the shuttering gives way, leaving an unsightly tongue of concrete poking into the next section. Next, within 24 hours of Hewlett telling us the horrendous consequences of a pump breaking down, a pump breaks down. As the previous load of concrete slowly hardens over several hours, Burse and Shall look on with horror. Unfortunately, we were let down by our suppliers. It's a hard lesson to learn in that we were bit and bit very hard. It's cost us a lot of money. What lesson can you learn? If we have two pumps and the two break down, if you have three pumps and three break down, I mean, in the eyes of the client, that was a bad slip. If you pour wet concrete on dry, it won't be as strong on the surface where they meet. So Burr start hammering in extra reinforcing rods to strengthen the next pour of concrete, and everyone has to help out. We've got a lot of it out on the same day, where obviously it was a lot easier. And we came in Saturday and did some more. But on the Monday, by Monday, it was uh, hard, and some of the hammers that we were using, some of the uh, air tools were useless and uh, it was a struggle from then on. It's been an unhappy week for Paul Hewlett. Charles is furious with Burse. They've been bleak days, a bleak day or two. The problems with the pumping are enough to, to take any man down. Uh, 
Michelle chose to follow that up with my superiors as well, which I took at the time as a, almost a personal front. And occasionally you do fall out, you know, it's not an exact science construction. Personalities and egos get in the way, unfortunately, sometimes. But you kiss and make up, you're over 21 and you just carry on. Fortunately, my boss is the sort of guy who won't allow that for too long. You've got to be smiling and happy. Six months later, bursts are still on site, way beyond their contracted finishing date, and it looks as if they'll be around for another six or eight weeks. Mike O'Rourke has mixed feelings about their performance. The quality is, is pretty good, um, but unfortunately they have let us down in terms of the amount of time they've taken to finish off their works. It was fine in the early days when they were putting in big bulk quantities of concrete, but it's finishing and managing and coordinating the remainder of their works that's taken the time. After Burr's finally finished the job, Charles starts proceedings for compensation. But Burr's has lost money too and hopes to persuade the Tate to pay them more than the contract price. One of Charles' senior managers reports on negotiations. Worst case result with Burr's is that they decide to go to claim with us, which will probably end up with us having a counterclaim against them for costs, which would, in all likelihood, net out at zero. They've got nothing to go with. Right. If they could talk to a lawyer, they could talk to us. I mean, there is no claim. They just know what the job's cost them. I mean, they have actually exercised their right to come and talk to the client, I think I reported last time. Yeah. And uh, our view was that they haven't got a hope in hell of substantiating their claim on the performance. And their approach to us has been, well, this job cost us a lot of money and we're entitled to a profit, aren't we, because we did this work for you. So let's throw away the agreement we made, take the amount of money it cost us, add a profit to it, and you pay us that, please. Burst do eventually get paid off, with less than they want, but more than the Tate feels is justified. The foundations are finally ready for Rowan to move in to erect the steel, and it's now even more important that over the next four months, Rowan stick to their ambitious program and budget. When the Tate first acquired the old power station, the building was so large and access to some places so difficult that there were still corners they hadn't explored. Peter Wilson, the Tate's director of buildings, was one of the first to penetrate the farthest recesses of the building, and he was surprised by what he found. When you get to the far end, you're at one of the oil tanks under the lawn on the southern side of the site. And uh, when we discovered what it was like inside the oil tank, all sorts of possibilities began to come to mind because it really is a vast space. These tanks don't form part of the original plan for Tate Modern. They are some distance from the main museum area. But although there isn't currently any money in the budget, Nick Sorota is keen to exploit them somehow. What this will give us the opportunity to do is to respond to whatever kind of art emerges and to use these spaces in a manner which is flexible in a contemporary sense and not flexible in the sense what was envisaged in the 1960s. The 1960s flexible meant simply having a cube which you divided with cardboard walls. Harry Gugger, too, wants to get his hands on the oil tanks, but the architects are still some way behind with the main design work. I think if you look at the space, you already discovered this is uh, very far away from our more classical exhibition spaces in the boiler house. And it's certainly a challenge not only for us to uh, uh, refurbish them, but even more for artists to get involved with the spaces to uh, have their art on display here. Sandy Nairn, the Tate's Director of Public Services, takes three British artists around the oil tanks. With them is Francis Morris, curator of the Bankside displays. What the, uh, you, you know, what's the difference between an underground space and a non-daylit? Is there a difference? 
you know, for, uh, for as people who work in spaces. Well, yeah, I just, it's just the idea that it's uh, got it's got weight above you, you know, and weight around you. That's yeah, very pressing impressive. in from all sides. You know? I, mean, I mean, I don't, I, I love the space. I don't find it too claustrophobic. But when you think of what it was used for, it, you know, it really is kind of pretty loaded in that, in that sense. But you know, it's interesting going around. You think of a certain kind of art that would be perfectly suitable for these. But wouldn't it be nice to see kind of conventional shows in this place like this? I mean, I, I, I myself would be very interested in a space that you could isolate from the rest of the building if you wanted to do something that, there that was more dangerous and, mm. you know, like um, you've had yeah. things that take that, you know, like the chlorine yes. piece. I'm very wary about this kind of sentimental attitude to the, to the columns and the dirt and the kind of crumbling concrete mm. because yeah. you might, you know, marginalise the activity simply by the nature of the space and all you're going to get a hairy performance artist throwing bags of offal around or something. With all this enthusiasm to do something with the oil tanks, there's the small matter of money. To convert them into display spaces will cost nine million pounds or more, and Nick Sorota has to persuade his colleagues that this will be a good use of the Tate's contingency funds. At a meeting at Millbank in December 1996, they're not at all convinced. Morning, absolutely. There's no more money. <laughs> the group feels that too much money would be wasted on the construction difficulties of working underground. Exactly. But frankly, for this amount of money, for £9 million, pounds, you're going to buy yourself a 20,000 foot gallery, brand new, at grade, without any complications, which could be a little gem of a building, mm. without any of these complications. Mm. I just wonder why. Yeah, my bullet. Right. Is this the moment when I say my bit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> why did we get a bank side? I've said this before. <laughs> Peter's doing some calculations. One of the reasons we went to Bankside was because it gave us the opportunity to do two very different things. One was to create very fine gallery spaces with one of the best architects in the world. The other was to make use of the industrial spaces within the building. If we were to be able to have both the fine spaces and these rougher spaces, it would give the Tate an instrument that all the other major museums of modern art in the world lack, but some of the more exciting and interesting smaller spaces have. And we know that the Pompidou Centre is about to be completely refurbished and will, its, improve, its appearance will be enormously improved inside. We know that the Museum of Modern Art in New York is about to create itself a $400 million campaign to take over, as far as I can understand, most of the space between the museum and 6th Avenue. Mm -hmm. If we're going to maintain ourselves in a position where we're able to do something which is different from those institutions, we do need to take in spaces like the oil tanks and spaces below the switch station. And I actually think that it, it's more likely that we will get a donor who gave us $9 million to do the oil tanks than that we get a donor who gave us nine million to build, build another perfect gallery space somewhere else in the building. The group goes on to discuss a whole list of competing demands for the money, including a sum set aside for educational project rooms. Sorota wants more money for them too. I think the budget there is too low. And the oil tank budget is too high. No, no, I don't. <laughs> we hope so. Michael, thank you. <laughs> just too high. If I'm being asked priorities, I would have said the project rooms was a higher priority than the more expensive oil tank development, which I think can occur later, although I know that Nick doesn't... There's a conspiratorial air about this meeting. The architects haven't been invited because the Tate doesn't want to distract them while they're behind with their existing design work. I think it's absolutely fine for us to set these priorities. I think it's a completely different thing to actually open up those debates with the design team at this point in time, and that's what I think we should actually be closing down those. We shouldn't be debating things we should done, so we're actually not. now instructing things. Well, that's why we're not here. I couldn't say how strongly I support that, Dawn. I'd like a promise from you all. This south building should not be investigated by Jacques until we have a set of drawings. Yeah, that's fine. I think that's, that's an fine. entirely fine. acceptable challenge. I don't think we've got the we money to all pay sign up to that. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's enthusiastic. In fact, the architects were eventually asked to produce a design for the oil tanks. There wasn't the money to convert them before the opening of the main gallery, but Sorota still lives in hope that in the next few years, these echoing spaces will be transformed into unique underground galleries. Late in 1997, Rowan are gearing up to erect the first steel. 
Shell needs them to start on their 15-week programme on December the 1st, or the entire timetable for the building will be affected. base in Nottinghamshire, all staff are working on fabricating the thousands of columns and beams required. But Rowan's preparations on site get off to a bad start. They've got to strengthen a concrete wall around the base of the building so that it will bear the weight of their steel columns. Drilling through the wall to fix strengthening plates under the columns turns out to be a nightmare. The works that are being carried out by us to the retaining wall are quite interesting and represent a fair amount of risk. The fact that we're cutting pockets onto the top of a 50-year-old concrete wall and drilling through that wall to provide restraint is definitely something that's out of the ordinary. And again, I suspect not too many people, particularly steel fabricators, have, have been involved in that line of work. On a wet and windy December the 3rd, the first columns go up at Bankside. They're late, but only by two days, and that's better than everyone had feared. The first columns form one of the four steel cores, towers which will hold some of the essential services and fire escape stairs. Then the floor beams will link the cores from one end of the building to the other. Rowan do their best to stay on schedule. Constructing a steel framework is still a manual task and they have to bring more men on site than they'd specified in their original proposal. But less than two months later, things are not looking good. Only a small amount of steel has been erected. Things are made more difficult by the fact that much of the steel has to be lifted in from outside the building through a roof that's like a sieve, and this requires careful manoeuvring by the cranes. Eight weeks after Rowan started the work, Mike O'Rourke has to explain the situation to the Tate. The news is not good. Rowan's are about three and a half weeks behind the programme at the moment. There's three reasons why Rowan's are in delay. Um, the primary one is they're, they're steel erectors, they're not concrete workers. Um, they've consistently failed to recognise the, the unknown elements and the complexity of the restraining plates to the retaining wall. Threading the steelwork through the existing roof structure, which is not our problem, it's Rowan's. They always knew it was there. And an over-optimistic view of the 15-week programme by Rowan's. Your first two contractors on site, construction contractors on site, have both been late. Is That's your right. programme real? That's the question you'll get asked. Yes, I'm aware of that. And did we buy it properly? We bought a 15-week programme with <coughs> the steelwork, which was unachievable. They looked at the programme at the time they were bidding, and they took a commercial view on it. Um, with hindsight, they're now kicking themselves, to be perfectly honest. It's a 100% failure rate at present. Two mm -hmm. trades and two, mm -hmm. two guys have failed. Mm -hmm. Is this something they were confident that we're going to stop at this point? Rowan tries desperately to speed up the work. They know they are in trouble and don't try to hide it. I mean, the way they've reacted to it, you know, has been exemplary, really. I mean, they put in two extra cranes, they're up to, I don't know, 80 or 90 guys on site, which is probably double what the tender allowance is. So they've not sat back and tried to defend this indefensible position. They've, they've said, hands up, you know, and thrown, and thrown resource at it. So for that, you've got to, you know, commend them for that. But the client's incurred costs, incurred delay, and this is an expensive animal to keep running. By week 20, five weeks past the date Rowan should have left the site, the new steel framework has reached the roof level. 
they now have to tackle the task of removing several 20-ton steel trusses that had held the building together. Actually, at a gala point at the moment with the removal of the roof trusses. I mean, getting the big 20 and 30 ton trusses out is, is a big boom for the job. And if we have any potential for speeding up the erection of the steelwork at high level, it's with those trusses out. But a small success can't disguise the larger failure. I don't think I've ever seen a contractor fail to the degree that failed here. And uh, They've, they underestimated everything in terms of its complexity, in terms of the volume of the work, the, the, the uh, exist, working within an existing envelope. And I think, to be honest, the whole team did. And it was only probably six, ten weeks into the process that people started realising what, what, what we really had here. And I've got, we've, I think the whole team have got sympathy with Rowan. And I think we deserve some credit for sticking to the task. The original programme was, was unachievable. Um, there was two steelwork competitors competing against each other and one bought the job to fight the other off, in my opinion. And I knew it was unrealistic from day one. At the time we were struggling to get over the issue of the um, asbestos and uh, the turbine hall roof was starting to rear its ugly head. So it would have been pretty foolish of anyone to stand up and say, well, OK, we know the trade contractors offered us 15 weeks for this sum of money, but let's let them do it in 20 anyway. They contracted to do the work. They were bullish about how quickly it could be done. They were wrong. They've paid a huge cost penalty in that. They behaved absolutely honourably throughout over money. They haven't tried to um, uh, get money back by uh, dodgy means, by making claims that couldn't be stood. They've been absolutely straight about it. Rowan's price for the contract had been a million pounds less than the Tate had set aside in their original budget. But now that saving has to be used to pay for the consequences of Rowan's delays. And Rowan too has lost money on the contract. It has not been a happy time for Peter Emerson, who tried so hard to get the job in the first place. Probably after Christmas, the realisation really came home that we were, you know, we were in in the ship basically and we needed to find a way out of it and we went away and, and focused on that. It's a project that we, we dearly wanted to win and we felt, perhaps with hindsight rather too optimistically, that we, we could improve upon the programme that had been set. What prevents it happening in future? Well, once bitten, twice shy. Uh, we've, we've been around as a business now for 50 years. This is the first and only time we've, we've been in this type of situation and we sure as hell don't intend being there again. The steel structure had finally taken from December 1997 to July 1998 to erect, more than twice the 15 weeks Rowan promised. Now more contractors are waiting to move in, though no one on the Tate team really believes that the problems are over, there are plenty of challenges ahead. They still hope to hand the building over to the Tate by the middle of 1999. But as the new wave of contractors move in to make staircases and windows and walls, it's a target that is increasingly at risk.
In 1997, the Tate's new museum, Tate Modern, to be built in Bankside Power Station in the heart of London, is running behind schedule, and the project team is becoming increasingly frustrated. But it's a very serious issue. At the end of the day, I, th I feel there'll be a five-week delay. They had a straightforward job. They managed it appallingly After bad. Christmas, the realisation really came home that we were in the shit, basically. But the worst seems over, as the steel skeleton and the new roof are finally put in place. The team can now turn to the interior of the building and hope that things will go more smoothly. The Tate's new modern art museum has cost £134 million. It retains a lot of the brick shell of the original building, but has galleries and public spaces where there were once turbines and boilers. This part of the power station is to hold five floors of galleries, along with restaurants and other facilities. They'll be linked by something called the Grand Staircase, which will thread its way through the building from the basement to the roof. Because it's to be made of steel, it will weigh 50 tonnes or so. It's a monster of a staircase and presents monstrous problems. The company that gets the Grand Stair contract is Trubros of Kegworth. They specialise in staircases, though they've never come across one quite like this. I believe that the architect's got very, very firm thoughts and I feel that he's going to see those through right until the bitter end. Hopefully, it will be a successful thought that he's had. It may be a major disaster. It soon becomes clear to Trubros that this is no ordinary staircase. Sometimes the architect's demands on them seem to require supernatural skills. For instance, the architect has unusual ideas about the wood he wants for the handrails. Ebony would be wonderful. Ebony, so a wood which in itself is a dark wood, which would, uh, but ebony you can't afford. And there is a wood called Wenge, which has similar qualities. Uh, still expensive, but we could afford it. But then it splitters much more. Adrian Waters had a different reason for rejecting the wood and a different pronunciation. The first choice for the handrail in particular was, was a, um, a timber called Wenge, um, which basically we could have done it in Wenge if we could have waited a few hundred years for the rest of the timber to grow. Um, there really is not sufficient quantities of the timber available in the world today to say that we could do the grand staircase at the Tate Gallery of Modern Art in that particular timber. Um, and again, the architects have looked at it and they actually said, having seen a sample of it, well, we don't like it anyway. We breathed a sigh of relief at this point. In December 1997, the work is well underway. Six landings have been made, nearly a third of the total, along with a number of flights of stairs. As Christmas approaches, the Trubros team are under some pressure and they offer this advice to the Tate. A notice to whom it concerns at the Tate regarding the stairs and the delivery date. Buy yourself a Christmas gift, a set of ladders or a lift. Trubros's worries increase when they hear some news that suggests that all their work so far on the landings might have been wasted. About 10 days ago, I was informed by my powers that be that uh, there's a slight hiccup in the, in the general sort of layout. We're just holding fire for a little while until we know exactly what they want. It might be quicker to scrap it, perhaps, I don't know. <laughs> Not my decision. The slight hiccup is to be discussed at one of the regular meetings where key design decisions are approved by Nick Sorota, director of the Tate, and his director of buildings, Peter Wilson. Also, 
puts us in that position. Harry Gugger has to persuade the group to agree to what he sees as a very important change in the design. There's a mistake in the plans for the Grand Stair, and Gaga has to choose his words carefully if he's not to alarm the meeting. Um, a little problem occurred here. This is, this is the Grand Stair. The Swiss architects took great pride in their unusual staircase, but from the moment it started to thread its way through the building, one problem followed another. The saga starts when the position of a lift motor room intrudes on the vertical line of the staircase. This is the agreed solution at the moment. Uh, we could make it work technically, but it leads to a little balcony here where there will be dust sitting on, and uh, this will tell everybody that the architect uh, made a major mistake for 50 years, since this stair will be there a long, long time. And, uh, Gaga then describes the solution that he favours to avoid the unsightly ledge, but it involves moving the position of several steel columns by 30 centimetres. This could cost 20 or 30,000 pounds and delay the steelwork by two weeks. Nick Sarota is angry. Forget it. We cannot possibly start rebuilding the steelwork and redesigning the steelwork. They're on site. We've said right from the outset, we cannot do it. We cannot have these people working over weekends and Christmas at huge cost, and then say we're going to have a two-week delay. Would be out of the way, and I feel to be in a Wilson, too, lays it on the line to Gaga. Every time we find a problem like this, and no doubt there will be others along the way, we're going to have to solve it in the most practical, pragmatic, quick way. And it's not going to be perfect, but I, I for one, I'm not going to spend money like that. It's just money thrown down the drain. No building is ever perfect, and you're going to have to live with the imperfections. We're just wasting time and money sitting here talking about it. This stair is going to be here for how many years? It doesn't matter, Harry. It won't be there at all if we don't do it to budget. But Harry, maybe there will be other fights where we would be happy when the client would rather accept our proposal. I think in this case we can very well live with... Jacques Herzog, Gaga's partner, seems unconcerned, but Gaga fights on. The Tate insists that if the steelwork is moved and causes a delay, other contractors could say they've been delayed too and claim compensation. See, if I would not be a toolmaker myself, and if I would not have done things like that by my hands, and if I not, would not know how this works, I wouldn't be pissed off. But I am pissed off because I know about these things. And they are telling us stories here, and I just don't believe them. Can I also say that from... The meeting seems at an impasse. Then Gaga leaves the group, summoned into a corner by Jacques Herzog. As the rest of the team continues the discussion, Gaga returns to admit defeat. Sending out the wrong message, but it really will open the doors. Okay, we tried hard. Let's yeah. go and see the mock-up. Gaga and the group then go to inspect a mock-up of the Grand Stairs' colours and finishes. But why has Gaga suddenly caved in? Did he make the decision on his own, or has Herzog exerted some kind of pressure? I think I take it, took it on my own, but I mean, he gave signals that he is uh, he's more relaxed about this old corner. Uh, it's not his mistake. Why I made this such an issue is also because if I think I think if we lose this one, we will lose many others. I think that's really like that's our duty. That's why there is still architects in the world, so that I uh, can translate in my uh, brain things into reality at the stage when others can't. The Tate has been a major repository of modern art for much of this century, and actually owns so many artworks that only about 10% is on display at Millbank. But there are gaps in the collection, and if Sorota wants Tate Modern to be comprehensive, he's going to have to borrow or beg from other museums or from wealthy donors. And she came on rather heavily about they're not as rich as everyone assumes they are and various other things. She said it with a smile, actually. Then I'm quite certain that we're not going to get a million out of her. But what did... One major gift to the Tate's new museum came from Janet de Botton, an art collector and one of the Tate trustees. In 1997, she gave the Tate a large number of contemporary artworks from her own collection.
As the works are assembled at the Tate at Millbank for a temporary exhibition, it's clear why this sort of art needs a lot of space. With contemporary art, a lot of it, people walk in, they are completely unfamiliar with anything that looks like this. And in a sense, that's what draws them and that's what repels them. And it's interesting to see how the more the space is opened up and people can see things the way they should be seen, the more enthusiastic they are, the more interest there is, the more they want to come back and see more. Modern art is often arranged by date or nationality or by movements such as cubism or surrealism. But Tate Modern wants to break the mould with a new 21st century way of organising their art. Two years before the opening of the museum, the curators begin thinking about how to organise the art in a meaningful way, and they meet to explain their preliminary ideas to Sorota. Francis Morris and Ivona Blaswick have colonised a small room and covered the walls with possible new frameworks for categorising and displaying 20th century art. It provides a kind of revelation that the way that the, the mindset within which... So In the last six months, they have brushed up their knowledge of Western art, literature, politics, popular culture, science and sociology. For the Tate group, the writing on the wall summarises some of the ideas they're now going to present to Sorota. We've been saying what if, and we've decided to find a number of alternatives from the evolutionary linear ism by ism model, which is one, but we're seeing if there are any others. And we came up with nine. <laughs> And we began by thinking about traditional sort of 19th century genres in art. Um, and we put down portraits, the nude, landscape, still life, narrative history, painting. And then we um, essentially made some connections between the 20th century subjects and the earlier genres. And, and in fact, we did at a very early stage, do a, I did a layout on that basis. And it looked pretty dull, actually because everything ended up looking like itself or its opposite. America. And uh, we really began with 1900 and worked through to the present day and tried to put down what we perceived as being remember. the kind of features of... Hmm? <laughs> what you could remember. What we could remember about our O-levels. <laughs> and interestingly, <laughs> we could remember very little about the first decade. But we knew an awful <laughs> lot about the 1980s and 90s. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, moving through time, we identified Paris, Berlin, New York, Milan and London as possible focal points for clusters of displays. And by the time we got to New York, we Decided you didn't like Decided it. Decided didn't like it, but... There are four suites of galleries to display the collection in the new museum. The curators convinced Sorota that they should use the four traditional genres of art they described to him first. So, for instance, on level three, there's a suite based on still life and another on landscape. Then, level five has suites based on the other two genres, the body and history and society. The galleries tell four stories about modern and contemporary art. Firstly, a story about what happens to the human body in art and society. And that is, a, 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 I suppose, a number of stories, complicated stories that have to do with the human figure and the human mind, as much as the present body and the absent body. Then there's a second story, that is about objects in the real world that comes from still life, that deals with the domestic realm and how we interact with vessels and deals with history and memory, with private and public. There's a third story which is to do with the wider environment, to do with the landscape, the landscape we see, but the landscape that we threaten, that we dig up, that endangers us. And there is a fourth story which is to do with history and politics and ideology and with gender and with issues surrounding race and class and third world, first world, which is a global story and it's in Southwark a local story. Four is 
As the team's ideas evolve, they try to make sure that the scheme they've come up with doesn't leak out. Because we're beginning now to get into an area of intellectual property. <laughs> mm. In terms of the fact that there are quite a number of other museums that are thinking about this <coughs> question at the moment. Mm. But actually, we want to make sure that the first place it happens is the tape. Yeah, not too much we do want to see it four months yeah. later at the Bombardier we, Centre. For many of the people working on the construction of Tate Modern, what's going to fill the galleries isn't a big issue. Today, lorry driver Steve Press is delivering the first piece of the Grand Staircase, and he's got his own views of modern art. Modern art is everywhere, I think. Everything was designed, so art, isn't it? Uh, somebody designs a lamppost and they make it the best they can, so that's modern art. A pile of bricks don't suit me. It's the big day, the grand stairs arriving on site. We've um, battled our way through an awful lot of problems on it. It really looks a bit like a skip at the moment, but when it's finished, it will be the business, I'm sure. As long as you don't dent it, that's the my biggest problem. And these are so flimsy. In April 1998, the steel workers have reached the highest point of the steel structure. It's precarious work, and amidst all the pressure to make up lost time, Shall, the company managing the construction, are proud of one fact about the current state of the site. What we mustn't lose sight of is that we've, to this day, still managed to avoid any reportable accidents on this job, and I intend to try and continue that way. But there's only so much Shal can do to protect construction workers from their own stupidity. They can't supervise every single worker and they take any breach seriously. If people are walking on steel, they're removed from the job. You do not walk on steel. Without a harness? No, you do not walk on tops of steel full stop. You, you straddle the beam and you duck shuffle along the beam. But on the day O'Rourke told us this, above his head, a couple of the intrepid steel erectors showed us what they think of these rules. With two years to go before the new museum opens, the Tate is about to announce the appointment of a director specifically for Tate Modern. Many people thought that Sorota himself would take the reins at the new gallery. It was, after all, a very tempting job. Me, I myself, I would say in the world of museums, uh, this has to be the most wonderful job in the world, really. It is very difficult, therefore, for those of us who've been involved from the beginning, not to think of Nick as the director of, of it, because there's almost been a, a feeling that that was an inevitability. There were uh, members of the board who felt quite strongly that this was a project which I had guided from the beginning, that for a number of reasons um, I ought to be the person who was the director when it opened, and indeed for the foreseeable future afterwards. Um, 
But in the end, wiser counsels prevailed. And we advertised the post, and we have had a range of very strong applicants. Were you on the side of the wiser councils? Um, I'm on the side of the greater good for the Tate Gallery. And I think it's important that it should go, if possible, to somebody who is of uh, a younger generation, uh, uh, certainly than myself, and uh, Nick is over 50, and I think it should be somebody in their 40s. Had I been 10 years younger, I would have wanted to apply for the post. So who is it to be? Who is to get the most wonderful job in the world? The Tate chooses Lars Nitver, a 44-year-old Swede who has been director of a Danish modern art museum. As Sorota gets ready to stand back from the limelight, he propels Nitva onto the stage. Since Sorota can't run the museum himself, perhaps he's chosen somebody he can control. Is that how Nitva sees it? No, I don't think so. And it's an obvious answer. Maybe I got the job partly because he thinks he can work together with me, which is a totally different thing. I think that converted industrial buildings seems to be the absolutely best museum buildings also, at least for modern and contemporary art. You don't put the same pressure on the audience in terms of high culture. You don't have so many symbols and signals uh, as you do when you have major staircases and colonnades and, and long sequences of galleries. But I think Nitva has to be brought up to date very quickly with the display plans that have already been made by the Tate team. He also wants to make modern art meaningful to the visitors and finds a useful metaphor from a recent visit to a game of cricket. First I thought, this is a stupid game. I mean, this is ridiculous. But then I thought, I mean, there are thousands of people here who think this is great. So it, maybe it's me. And of course, I didn't know the rules. I didn't know the players. I didn't know the teams. I had no history in it. And, and it became meaningless. And in that I mean, in that sense, you can learn something without coming to a final conclusion, also about an artwork. The more you know, the more you see. In the summer of 1998, the main elements of the Grand Stair are in place, connecting all seven floors of the gallery. But the saga is not over yet. Here, near the bottom of the staircase, these flights of stairs are too close together. It's going to be a difficult problem to put right. We haven't got the headroom. I mean, it was designed right on the statutory minimum. Uh, and with building tolerances, we're below that now. So we're below two metres. Uh, and if you actually walk, if you're six foot plus, walk down there with a hard hat on, you'll hit your head. So what we've got to do is we're going to gain an extra 150 mil by cutting the staircase and setting it back horizontally. It was never the idea that this should be uh, all the way uh, through the same. It, it, the stair reacts on, on different conditions on the different floors, looking out onto the concourses and so on. And therefore, we liked it that in one instance you would be really compressed there. And I think certain people uh, think also that's just a bit over the top, you know. In, and that they would like this a bit to be, to be more generous. In fact, being more generous is required by law. The stair is currently contravening building regulations and the relocation of one level could cost £60,000. To Andy Butler, with responsibility for the budget, it's the last straw. I think it's a pretty contrived, poor element. I think anything that costs the amount of money it's cost tells you something that you've got it wrong. That staircase costs £13,000 a tonne to fabricate. I've never known a staircase cost anything like that in my life. I know that one person for certain knows the weight of this stair exactly and he complains about it every time. It's Andy Butler, the new uh, project manager. He is an engineer and he's always saying, uh, I don't know the tons, but it's many tons. Oh, you are wasting this many tons of steel on this staircase, and he can't believe it. It's still very heavy, because it's uh, going all the way up 40 meters, and uh, so it's uh, a mother of a piece. 
So, a year after these sections had been originally installed, Trubross are back to move one of them. Adrian Waters is not surprised. Everybody thought, hate to use the words, get away with it, but everybody thought they were going to get away with it, but they didn't. Well, in the early stages, we pointed out that the, the Adrian was tight, but they did say that it was something they designed and it was OK, but I think, um, and I'm sorry, a bit later on in the day, we decided it's not, so I've got to alter it. I know we'd be coming back anyway. It's always harder to, to dismantle anything than erect it in the first place. Um, and so we've got a double whammy here. We've got to take it out, which will be awkward because it's all bolted or welded. And then we've got to put it all back and, and re-weld it into exactly the same position. We're going to lift it up, move it over to this side here, um, drop it on the floor, and we're going to shorten the top landing by about 300 mil. By shortening it, it moves it that way, and by moving it that way, it will give us more headroom. Hopefully, that's what they want. the team's successes at overcoming the problems, the ledge that Harry Gugger had tried so hard to avoid is a reminder of the staircase's troubled history. And some of the people who worked on the Grand Stair for a year or more don't have a kind word to say about it. We're still struggling with the Grand Stair. We're still doing modifications to the base structure, but over a year after it was first installed. Um, so the word debacle and complete would, could be used in the... In, and that's being polite. At the heart of the new museum are the galleries, and Herzog and de Meuron's designs have a ruthless simplicity about them. They've worked hard to keep the rooms free of distractions that might spoil people's appreciation of the art. But there are some distractions, skirting boards for example, that are often very useful to protect against the assaults of floor cleaning machines. I mean, why should I need skirting boards? Is there any reason why I should have skirting? Well, only because lots of places have skirting boards. Yeah, in your domestic places, but not in the museum. Didn't it present some problems to do with cleaning or with something? Yeah, but I don't build a museum to be cleaned in the best possible way. They need to be cleaned in a good way, but maybe we have uh, less good cleaning performance, but a better per perception performance. And I think there are so many museums today which don't have that anymore. Eventually, the Tate agrees to do without skirting boards, but there will have to be what's called a shadow gap at the bottom of the wall to accommodate floor movement within the building. A mock-up of the corner of a gallery was built to show what this would look like. And there is a gap here which is not very nicely done between the floor and the ceiling. And just to uh, explain to you, <coughs> we try to make this as nice as possible. But we don't fill the gap because we will have unsealed boards and the mastic or uh, the silicon would bleed out into this unsealed floor. So uh, there will again be an open gap. I, I wish to have no gap in my... my, my Technically it's not possible. Ah. The wooden floor again uh, needs to be able to, uh, have, to take up movement. Move. Yes. Don't worry, then, Joe. we'll do it when you're finished. If it's technically impossible, we'll do it afterwards. Yeah. But don't, you, don't you agree? Because the gap is, is re it's again, it's, it looks like a theatre stage. You know, it looks like the wall is not standing on the floor. If, to satisfy Herzog, the gap is filled in, it will have to be with something flexible. Mastic is a flexible resin-based sealer, but Guga thinks it won't expand enough. If they bring in heavy art, the whole, the whole floor deflects to 25 mm. This is this big and no mastic does this. But that's why, that's why it would work with mastic, because if they have a heavy piece of, of art, they can, they can fix it. If you have a gap, you always have a gap. It's a weird situation to argue with. I'm, I'm, I'm not in mastic. <laughs> I'm not in gaps either. But somehow I have understood how this bloody building works. 
For the architects, it's important to get the walls and the floors right. They'll be the most visible face of the interior of the building once the galleries are completed. And Herzog and de Meuron have very strong ideas about the surfaces they design. They've chosen a very unusual type of wooden floor for some of the galleries. On top of a layer of plywood, there are 90 kilometers of thin oak strips, and the architects have decided that the wood surface will be rough and unvarnished. The floor contractors have never seen anything like it. The oak is very susceptible to, to staining. It marks very easy. As you can see, we, it's not a smooth finish. The client explained to us that they've, they've taken an, an industrial building, they want to keep an industrial look, and that's what they're achieving with the floor. Um, they're quite happy that the, the floor will grow with the museum, um, with marks and foot my wear and whatever. And it's far from a traditional contract. We, it's, it's not what we would normally consider to be a finished floor at all, but it's what the client wants. Um, they want a rough floor, and we can give it to them. Once the floors and walls are in place, a problem becomes apparent that is to prove very difficult to fix. The walls in the first room to be completed start to crack. No one knows why, although Andy Butler has a hunch. There's been some mechanical damage, which is the guys putting the timber floors down, physically banging the timbers in, which sends a vibration up the wall. Nothing to do with us at all. Um, yes, I think they tried blaming us initially um, when we were putting some of the ply down. But if you can visualise how a tunnel and groove board works, you butt boards together. So you can only start in one corner and work away in two directions. They got cracking in four walls. It couldn't possibly be us. The problem first appears in this room, the double height gallery, and the company fixing the walls, called R&S, tries a variety of fillers and tape but nothing seems to work. The cracks just keep on appearing. Uh, I've been telling my colleagues that it's not achievable um, to have a crack-free building within the period that they're trying to uh, deliver the building. They were told confidently by r &S that it was, but I never believed it, which is why I am uh, unfazed by it. It's well documented. People in museums have been talking about it for years. It's just that the construction industry thinks it knows best. With some of the walls and floors in place, the shadow gap that the architects were worried about is all too visible. It's not until a few weeks before the opening that the gap, all three kilometers of it, is finally filled. Two years before the opening of Tate Modern, as public interest grows, the Tate begins to get nervous about whether they've provided enough facilities for the numbers of visitors who will flock to the gallery. I think we're having to come to terms with the fact that this building in its first year is going to probably be visited by anything between two and three million people. And it was a building that was designed for anything between 1.5 and 2 million visitors. So we're going to have to think hard about how we make people feel welcome, avoid lines, avoid queues outside lavatories and so on. It's always good to learn from someone else's mistakes, and a Tate group visit the Getty Museum in Los Angeles, which had opened the year before. There were over two million visitors now in the first year of operation, which exceeds expectations that, that uh, the experts that we hired to look at flow through the building and attendance and what have you. The most obvious difference between the Getty and Tate Modern is the cost. As the Tate team look around, they can see evidence everywhere of the Getty's lavish budget. It works out in excess of $1,000 a square foot of building, which is eight times what Bankside is. <laughs> The, the meaningless comparisons, really. Uh, it is what it is, and it's fantastic. Oh, God, look at that. Do you think they have a Friday morning meeting like we did? <laughs> yeah, the other way around. <laughs> You've not spent enough. Come on, guys. <laughs> One of Herzog and de Meuron's bugbears is signs. They don't want any if they can help it. I'm surprised they like the signage. 
all the things we're talking about. We don't. We want to make it as discreet as possible. Don't we? Believe me, we did too, and I think that's as discreet as we could get away with. With all the money they had at their disposal, the Getty had when been able to afford an extremely sophisticated lighting control system. But even Getty money couldn't make it work. There you have it. It was absolutely trouble free, never had a problem putting it in, and that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> in my experience in, in building things, mm -hmm. you know, you have three things that are important. You have cost, you have schedule, and you have quality. Yeah. And it's kind of pick two. You can't get all three. No corner of the Getty, however boring, goes unvisited, as the tape team penetrates the heart of the Getty's air conditioning system, the cooling towers. By the end of the visit, they've learnt a few lessons. The obvious one that is terrifying is that there will be far more people than we have uh, bargained for. It's probably important not to constrain yourself by assuming that you've got to solve every problem in the first place. And we've probably done that, haven't we, over um, public toilets. I mean, we've got them everywhere, and we've, and we've reacted to the dismal situation that we, have at, that we have at uh, at Millbank by putting in lots and uh, um, we probably, I, I suspect we won't have that kind of a problem but, but there'll be some other problem that we didn't think about like, like the cloakroom or um, um, well, queuing yeah. for tickets or, or whatever. These are very awkward steps aren't they? Quite the wrong pitch. While the Getty is readjusting its visitor services a year after opening to cope with unexpected crowds, the entrance area at Bankside is still a building site. Herzog and de Meuron have suggested locations for ticketing and information, lavatories and cloakrooms. The Tate has consulted a Canadian firm to test those ideas and see if they work. It's Dawn Orswick's job as the Tate's project director to persuade the architects to accept any changes suggested by the consultants. It's balancing the needs of the, the low time with yeah. the very high time. Ari Gugger arrives late, irritated by being stuck on the London tube. They say like, oh sorry, we have a little bit of a delay. And then you don't hear anything for half an hour and you start really to freak out in this train, you know? The consultants have already spent some time poring over the architect's plans and considering changes. But the Tate hadn't told Guga about this. What's the background of your company? But uh, I, I don't know you, sorry. But, uh... <laughs> Museum and gallery planning. Um, so, I mean, the, the company is based in Toronto and it's been going for about 17 years. The group are planning to go out into the turbine hall to get a sense of the problems, but Guga still wonders whether any of this is necessary. Uh, amateurs can't really assess what the building will be, you know. Uh, it's shrinking at this time and it will grow again once sure. the finishes are on. And uh, so it's quite difficult. Are we're amateurs, are you, Harry? Yes, I am. Um, <laughs> As they set off into the turbine hall, one of the consultants is clearly a little worried about Guga's attitude. Oh, I think Harry's just in a bad mood. I shouldn't, no. No, um, don't worry about it. As the consultants point out some elements that might confuse the visitors, Guga is defensive. He explains how much better the new Tate is than the Pompidou Centre in Paris, but people still manage to find their way around there. And you don't have a clue where to go because mm. the ticketing is somewhere back in the, there is this atrium yeah. going down and people find obviously their way and this is pretty easy to read compared to what we have there. I mean you come in, you have a big space, you have a platform, you have a ticketing booth. So what? I mean, If Guga is unfamiliar with the consultants, they don't seem too sure who he is either. I, if I could just ask a representative of the architect, when, when you look Harry. at... Sorry, Harry. It's all right. How did you envision the people moving through this space? Well, that's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm, I can't imagine uh, this figure and what happens. I, I therefore never had a kind of a specific pattern in mind how people here would move, because I think that's such a generous space that even with a lot of people, you just find your way. Guga rejects the consultant's suggestions one by one. I still think we've found the right solution, so... Uh, I can't imagine another option. 
You have to open your mind temporarily. Well, my mind is wide open. Oh, that's good then. That's the reason why I'm sure that's the right thing. He's very stubborn. The root of Guga's irritation is the fact that, as far as he's concerned, the whole design of the area is fine, and he doesn't see any need for this kind of process. The group decides to reconvene in the meeting room. These guys are a pain in the ass, you know. Consultants with no responsibility. On the way back, the consultants look at a hole for a staircase that, at the moment, is designed to face the entrance ramp. It could cause traffic flow problems on the floor below, and the two consultants suddenly have the same idea. I think we'd be shot for suggesting that the, uh, we go the other way. I'm, that's exactly what I was thinking. It's, if it came down that way, it's less of a crush here, and it frees up a whole bunch of functional space under the staircase for ticketing information. Anyway. You didn't hear that. Back in the meeting, the consultants test the idea they've just had. Is there any mileage in the stairs going the other way? Instead of going that way, going that way? <laughs> no. no. Go away. We had just that. We had that. <laughs> he asked all the questions that we've asked. We had that debate. Yeah, but this, no. No is the answer. So far, the consultants and the Tate have pressed all the wrong buttons as far as Guga is concerned. Now here comes another one. The way the design has to reflect the importance of the museum shop to the Tate's revenue. Uh, one of the questions, one of the points you made early on, Don, was yeah. the issue of clear line of sight access and um, ambition to the shop. The brief is that everyone who comes down to leave the building must have Easy. maximum opportunity to yes. visit the shop. Um, and that's the requirement. For Guga, these are all issues that he thought had been settled in the Herzog and de Meuron design. I'm still convinced. I mean, it's very robust. For example, this whole issue about the shop. I'm going to a shop because I want to buy a book and not because I'm forced into it, you know. Uh, I don't need to be pushed in a shop. I, I, I even would not uh, allow this to happen. I really think if this is the future of museums, I'm not interested anymore in that. I mean, I'm very aware that they have a large revenue and they are important. But again, I think we've done everything to make it an attractive spot, an attractive location, and we'll make everything to design to make it a beautiful design. The meeting petered out with no decisions made. Harry Gugger saw the whole process as the intrusion of commercialism into the process of design. I have to catch my brain, so. In any complex building, there are constant clashes between the vision of the architect and the real world. The story of the turbine hall bay windows, surrounded by fluorescent tubes behind frosted glass, shows how difficult it can be to achieve an effect that seems simple to the architects. These bay windows would be best described as clouds of light. It's really, it should be, again, um, a strong statement, but also at the same time almost unreal. This was like the image we have, so the translucency was always a, a big issue. Schall gave the contract for the light boxes to an Austrian company called Boog, who tried their best to come up with samples of glass that would satisfy the architect's vision with disappointing results. From the architectural point of view, when standing in the turbine hall, the architect doesn't want to see any light at all. He purely wants to see a nice white, glowing luminescence. Um, that is what the architect wants. Unfortunately, the glass is not the right material to try and achieve that, and it's taken a considerable amount of heartache. As the turbine hall wall is filled in around where the balconies will go, the glass is being processed in a tortuous journey around Europe. The basic glass is manufactured in Spain. It's um, um, toughened, heat-soaked, laminated in Spain. It then travels to uh, Austria, where it has some uh, the, the sandblasting and uh, the, the, the sandblasting treatment applied. It then travels to Germany to have the protective coating applied. Back to Austria, where it has the fixings applied, and then it's created and shipped 
here, so it, it's well-travelled grass. Early in 1999, Boog say that they have now prepared all the glass for the light boxes. But as the finished balconies stand by to receive the glass, it fails to arrive on site, although there are men standing by to fix it. And they have weeks and weeks and weeks of work with all these thousands of, of light fittings. Right, with the panels. The panels. When, are, when are they due to have the panels? Now. And where they're, are they? They're made. They're in Austria. They can't find them. Well, what are they doing about it? They're remaking them. We can't legislate for, for things that have been made and then are lost. There's, you know, there's not time for them to, uh, to lose things and do things you know, differently. And I thought we were making progress with them, but it sounds like we're not. When the glass does arrive, the clouds of light effect is disrupted by very visible fluorescent tubes, and the architects and the Tate are very unhappy about it. If it does end up looking as it does at the moment, like a, a glass covering a lot of lamps that are very uh, visible, then it will look uh, not like a piece of Herzog and de Marat architecture, and actually rather like certain kinds of artwork that we might one day want to display. And so I think it would be wrong not to solve the problem. They were just too uh, transparent. They were um, showing, expressing uh, the, the light beams. I think what happened in this case is we had a contractor who had a, for a number of reasons, we have a sheet of glass here which doesn't perform the way we imagined it to. But they could say that that's a problem with your imagination rather than with their glass. No, I don't think so. There was a, we had a series of specifications in the beginning and uh, I think they had a difficulty in matching our specification. Boog tries yet more diffusion methods and in September 1999 their latest samples are produced. Either because they like it or because of sheer exhaustion, the Tate team and the architects decide to accept the whitest of these three samples. Herzogs are happy, Peter's happy, and I'm confident that when it's up, it'll look an awful lot better than the original samples that were approved way, way back. So, a year later than originally scheduled, Boog begins putting the well-travelled and treated glass on these enormous balconies on levels three and five. The clear section is the viewing window and the translucent ends cover the lights. The turbine hall finally has its clouds of light, nine months later than planned and at an additional cost of £250,000. But there is one final nasty surprise. It is still possible to see the light tubes at the ends of the light boxes, a phenomenon Michael Casey has difficulty explaining, but he tries. With the front panels of the bay windows, you don't see them at such a distance as you do from the ends. So when you walk into the turbine hall, you've got a view of 120 metres, and that somehow seems to compress the light, so you see the batons more. Don't know? As the interior fills out with walls and floors, balconies and concourses, the Tate team looks ahead to completing the building in 1999 for a target opening date in May 2000. But when the building is finally completed and handed over, there will still be the task of filling 84 rooms with several hundred complex works of art. That is the task that now faces six teams of art handlers, trying to do in four months what was originally scheduled for seven. It's touch and go as to whether they'll complete it in time for a royal opening.
The Tate and its architects had spent five years designing and constructing the new Tate Modern in Bankside Power Station. Now, in 1999, the team have to get the building ready to install art. A few weeks from the handover date, there's a rush to get as many contractors on site as possible, but that only slows things down. The man installing the ceilings is particularly bothered. There's just too many problems access-wise. Too many people still working out there, too much gear in the way. Too much unresolved design. I mean, there's bulkheads missing, walls that should be there and not there, that's not going to be there now. First aid room, we got stopped because the laggers haven't finished. We then went to the interview room, we got chucked out of there because the lagging's not finished. Uh, we're trying to get into the cash room. Uh, level six, we've been stopped in the southeast corner because uh, Lever Lux have got to do something with their blind boxes. I think they've got to move them to a new position they've been instructed to do. And the last thing we've got is whatever happened to the steel for the Link Bridge ceiling. Uh, 160 lengths at four metres long and it has vanished off the face of the earth. Some of the times where the pressure's been really intense and you're trying to get across, explain to, so we say, the management team the problem and you think, you know, are they, am I talking some sort of different language to them? You know, it's, to me it seems very plain to see and either they don't want to listen or it doesn't fit in with their game plan and you just you think that you're just banging your head against the wall. The Swiss architects Herzog and de Meuron had tried not to interfere too much with the exterior of the old power station, but they had designed this shining new roof extension called the light beam, which is nearing completion. In the old boiler house, there are five floors of galleries and public spaces, while the turbine hall is to be a huge entrance area. Throughout the building, the architects have chosen finishes that reflect the industrial origins of the building. But they're insisting on high quality, on surfaces like the smooth concrete floor on this indoor bridge. This is meant to be finished work. Peter Rogers is a construction guru who's helped the Tate to stay on target throughout the project. He keeps an eye on the construction managers, a company called Shal. Peter's role is to be, at certain moments, the client's representative and to argue on our behalf that certain things should happen. And he has enormous experience of the building industry. Why is he going out in the skip? It's damaged, it's cleaned up here for months. He has probably more experience than many of the people working in Shaw. And then for, from time to time, he can give them advice, which we hope they'll take. On a typical day, Roger sweeps through the site, looking for ways to make the site work more smoothly. Today, he's found one. I still argue, why the hell do we allow so much material on the site? This stuff is yeah, new, right. being delivered right now. To go now. out there trying to put ductwork up, it's trapped between pipes and other things. These huge ducts will carry heated and cooled air through the building. The whole principle of trying to get stuff in when you actually need it for a couple of days and no more, which I think is essential. We had, you know, look at the duct work that's up here. There's got to be more than a few days' worth of work on You and your bloody duct work. <laughs> look at it! And there's duct work everywhere. What's going on? You sure you're not sure of duct work on the job? You know, there's a bit, a bit of spare duct work here for you if you need it. You look, look, come here. That's the issue. How long has it been here? That one's been up and down for some reason. Rogers may seem obsessed with duct work, but he's keen to do anything that will help the project make up for lost time. But it just you know, it gets damaged. In a year from now, there'll be a giant sculpture here in the turbine hall, paid for by Unilever. The Tate senior curators had little trouble deciding who should get the commission. We needed to come up with an artist who was ambitious enough and fantastic enough and confident enough and established enough to cope with uh, possibly the most major project of their career at the opening of the new Tate Modern Art, which is a really big um, deal. And our shortlist... Um, quickly boiled down to one person, that person was Louise Bourgeois. Art is a guarantee of sanity. If you are an artist, you are not going to go cuckoo. You are cuckoo. Toe, toe, toe.
Bourgeois is now 88, and her life and art span most of the 20th century. She grew up alongside surrealism. She matured alongside abstract expressionism, and yet she's still maturing and growing up and being young through the years of early feminist art, conceptual art, engaged art, and remains, I think, one of the single most important influences, role models for contemporary artists now. Hello. Hi, Sam. Hello. How nice to see you. Can I? And uh, may I present my colleague, Phil Monk? How do you do? Frances Morris and her colleague are visiting Bourgeois in New York to get their first glimpse of a model of her sculpture, which will be made up of three 40-foot towers. I've never seen this maquette. I've seen a uh, transparency, but it, this, it looked much smaller in the transparency. <coughs> In her ninth decade, the sculptor has earned the right to be idiosyncratic, cranky and incomprehensible, and she is all of these during the meeting. First of all, may I, may I mention the fact that you have to sit in front of me, keep an eye contact with me, and please know what you are saying. I'll try. Uh, that's all you can do. The towers will have stairs for visitors to climb and a platform at the top with a chair and a mirror that can swing around. It was set up as a, as a visual, uh, pleasure-giving monument because uh, when uh, people see that thing, they, they, they are really wondering, what does that damn thing mean? Why is it there? Sometimes you are wandering in, uh, in this world and, and you are anxious as to who am I going to meet? Am I going to meet somebody interesting or am I condemned to meet only idiots? Bourgeois Towers will stand on the Turbine Hall floor, overlooked by the galleries. You'll be pleased to hear that when you look down on your towers from the fifth floor of the Turbine Hall, yes. you will look down on them from a room of paintings by Francis Bacon. Oh, that's interesting. Which are fabulous paintings. Wonderful, wonderful. Would you want us to show our Rodin holdings? Rodin? Not at all. I'm not interested in Rodin in the least. He was a naturalist. This book is full of Rodin. I see. Right, that's not my fault. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was just asking. Giacometti? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I know. You see, if, uh, if you talk about people I knew personally, uh, it becomes embarrassing because uh, Giacometti had become a very sour puss in his old age. Right. Why? He felt that he was not appreciated. Oh. But we are not going into name dropping now. If, uh, if you want a session of name dropping, uh, we have to organize something else. That's making them, uh, Morris and Monk then visit a workshop in Brooklyn where another component of the bourgeois sculpture is being fabricated, a very large spider. There's a lot, of, a lot of stress on it, and uh, this, is, this is made out of steel if, uh, uh, with armatures so that uh, there is no structural problem. But, uh, and if you put it on a smooth floor, you got to put stops on it. Well, we, I want these to be bolted. These because you're going to have to bolt yeah. them, otherwise yeah. they'll move on you. We don't want them moving. It's actually walking up the ramp from <laughs> to the building. So what, what's the overall it's spread then across the legs? About yeah. 40 feet. 40 feet. One of the things we have to do is that um, as part of the opening there have to be various like, private events and functions in the space and we're being hassled for placement by our um, PR people who want to know how many people they can invite to dinner and where the tables can go. But presumably the spider, apart from the bits where the legs come down, we can put tables underneath them and around them. Yeah, as I was saying, the center of the spider is about 24 feet high. Yeah. And uh, most of the legs go up 
vertically, uh, almost on a, I would say almost on a 70 degree angle right away. Right. One is, is a little longer, about a uh, 45 degree angle. Mm. But the rest of them, you can almost sit next to the leg. Yeah. Two months later, in a yard in New Jersey, the spider is assembled for the first and only time before it arrives in the turbine hall. The building is enclosed by mid-1999, but there's a problem with pigeons getting into the turbine hall. Their droppings damage the new walls and floor. They have to be persuaded to move, and Alice is going to do it. This is Alice, she's a Harris hawk. We fly the hawk round. Um, the fact that she's a natural predator is enough to scare the pigeons. The aim isn't actually to kill the pigeons. In fact, we try to discourage the birds from actually catching them. But they will give the pigeon a good chase, um, and the pigeon thinks, oh, I'd sooner not be here. It's a dangerous environment to be in. And so they relocate. Alice pays weekly visits to the turbine hall, and most of the pigeon population does eventually relocate. <coughs> Harry Gugger is the architect who spends most time on site, and as the building nears completion, he gets more and more worried about the quality of the workmanship. The sprinkler heads are sticking out of the line of the bulkhead. The services are wrong. It's one of those architects things, isn't it? But you see What's the paper, paper in the clear that it's all stiffing? Are you ever going to I can't live with it. I mean, this is... Ask too much, I guess. The reflection is very good, though. Very flat, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's very flat. I still can't cope with the situation over here. Since uh, if sometimes I allow myself to walk around on site, I'm always frustrated afterwards. And um, it's just the, the general level of quality which I think is terrible. I mean, there is a row of floor grills and in the middle of five floor grills, they just left one out and, um, and no one tells me, I mean, and I'm, I'm not supposed to tell anybody, so who knows about this? If I find in a row of five grills just missing one out, this is really, then I'm freaking out because this makes me really, then I think, who the hell cares for this? I mean, uh, how can this, such an obvious thing happen? The Tate has tried very hard to control media coverage of the project, but when Building Magazine prepares an article on Bankside, Harry Gugger slips through the net. When a journalist contacts him directly, he is not complimentary. I don't enjoy the site, he's quoted as saying. Things are carelessly put together, and there are problems with how the site looks. Switzerland is paradise in comparison. The quality of craftsmanship is far better. Now, Harry hadn't read the script, unfortunately, so um, he spoke from the heart uh, and wasn't quite in kilter with what we were saying. I think there were a few phone calls flying around. Yeah, I think it stopped at Tony Blair, actually. <laughs> it's difficult to talk about this because I'm supposed to say it's all great and wonderful and someone teached me, how should I express this? Um, of course, there are differences in qualities, and some of it is wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's the answer I'm supposed to give you now. To get quick results when things need to be changed, Guga has found that it's easier to bypass the construction team and go straight to the top, to Nick Sarota, director of the Tate. I mean, Harry, he's found that going to Nick is a natural route for him to uh, be able to express his frustrations about that sort of thing. We knew it would happen, Nick knew it would happen, uh, we planned for it. 
with Harry, the seriousness of the situation we're in needs to be got through to him. He's got to help finish this building. He cannot. We can deal with that. Yes. Nick, you need to make clear to, to, to Jacques and Harry the position. They both believe, and the site believes, that if there's a real issue, they will come around the back door to you and you will side with them. Doesn't matter how true it is, that's, you know, that's. Sorry, the site believes that we'll side with the architects. Yeah. And I think Jacques. Plenty of examples where we haven't. I, but it doesn't matter. It makes a farce of my job when I sit in a meeting and we sort of try and put some discipline into it, and then there's a meeting offline and it filters its way down, and that causes untold confusion. Because if I'm confused, what about these 600 guys out there? One issue where the architects doggedly stick to their vision and where Sorota sides with them is to do with the finishes on the gallery doors. Even late in 1999, the final decision hasn't been made, although the easiest and cheapest option is to have natural wood veneers. But the architects want something darker. Do you know oak which has been weathered? Yeah. It's getting this greyish tone. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. We are not aiming for, for, for black. It's like a, 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 an aged oak. And it has this silvery, has this silvery surface. Tate Modern's director is Lars Nitfer, a Swede. And Jacques Herzog, the senior Swiss architect, has a dig at him. Because if you see in this industrial space a clearly wooden panel, clearly wood, wood, it's would be too Swedish. Yes, too Swedish, yes. <laughs> <laughs> can, can anything be too Swedish? <laughs> <laughs> Better too Swedish than too Swiss, Lars. <laughs> <laughs> The architect's idea of staining the doors to make them look like aged oak seems impossible to achieve, and the first doors to be installed are plain wood. And I like the actual timber effect, but apparently that's all going. They want to have the industrial look now, so it's, uh, they're going to cover it all over, which is a shame, but there you are. In October, the Tate find a company in Doncaster that might have the right stain. They didn't have exactly the colour we wanted, but they did have uh, stocks of wood outside in the yard that had been aged, so we could say, look, exactly like that. And they said, oh yes, exactly like that, we know how to do that. When the first samples of stained doors arrive on site, everyone hopes they'll be what the architects wanted. In fact, the Tate and the architects are pleased with the colour, and a number of other doors are shipped north to be stained in the same way. But then... Disaster struck, uh, I think it was the early hours of Sunday morning at CW Fields in Doncaster, and they had a massive fire throughout the factory, and it completely devastated the factory, and plus all our doors. So we've lost in total, um, what's that, 26, we've lost about 35 doors. Hmm. Good moment was getting the timber doors finally sorted and a very nice stain to them. <laughs> the bad moment was finding out that the factory burned down. You, wa you wanted black doors? Yeah, I've got them now. <laughs> that, but I didn't want ash, I wanted oak. <laughs> Christmas 1999, several months later than planned, the building is finally handed over to the Tate for Frances Morris and her team of curators to get to work on installing the art. No, I think the, the best thing about the job at the moment is that the milestones we established as milestones, pre-Christmas milestones, to do with finalising content, finally getting there, making those decisions, those arm wrestling matches between curators, all those things that have been kind of bumping along the bottom for months and months and months, have now come in, come home, been resolved, and have been you know, put out. So are there are other people's problems now. Um, and the next thing we move into is the process of installing, which is, I think, going to be immense fun. It actually turns out to be less fun than Morris expected when she and her colleague Phil Monk discover the state of the floors and walls in the brand new galleries. But look, these marks here are kind of... 
very suspect, aren't they? It's this side of the gallery, of, the, of, of this level, that I'm worried about because we want to bring the works in here first. That looks like a footprint, a boot print mark. Well, yes, but is it just a... And it won't come off? I think it might. Do you? Yeah, if we go around the gallery like that with our fingertips. This floor is appalling. Because somebody has been in here with... Well, this is where they've had the, yeah, the motocross session. There's another very visible problem in some galleries. With the movement of the building, the walls have developed cracks. I thought, I thought the plaster cracking wasn't quite so bad on the outside walls, but it is. But are you aiming to redo all those plaster cracks before we bring the cases in? Would that, that would be the ideal scenario. Yeah, well, because of the nature of the works that we want to bring in, it's going to be very difficult to do any of this work afterwards. Yeah, it will mean Classic hanging and paintings. taking works away again and rehanging afterwards. And there's a lot of it, it's all over the show. I would come into this new building and be looking at all of these things and I'd think it was a bit kind of crappy, actually. I've got a concern that actually when we install the work, we may get additional cracking from well, we... the weight and pressure applied to the walls. But there's no point in uh, polyfilling them in two weeks' time, only to have the cracks appear again three days before we, our first opening event. So we ought to maybe live with them. Remedy Although we're probably open with some cracks, but people will be so stunned by the display so they won't see the cracks, I would hope. Whatever Morris's worries, there's no stopping the juggernaut of art installation. The first work to be installed in Tate Modern is called The End of the 20th Century by the German artist Joseph Boyce. It consists of 31 blocks of stone and on January the 6th, at the beginning of the 21st century, they set off for the new museum. It's stones, it's laid out in a special way. It's quite a nice, nice artwork, it's a modern artwork. With the boys, the problem is you, you do have to have a flatbed truck, which has got the air ride, which this is straight over to the Dunya jet. Um, and uh, it's handling it, it's heavy. Every, every one of those blocks weighs at least a tonne, and the, 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 the last 12 weigh over a tonne and a half, each, so they're a bit heavier than these. Some of the regular team turn up to witness the moment that Tate Modern becomes an art gallery. Yeah, I think you can sense the, the, the gravitas from the scale. Imagine there's only trouble. So and then you mind where they are. It's a good test for the new equipment for handling art, and the equipment fails. This platform should move to enable crates to be wheeled off vehicles of any height, but it isn't working properly. No. Yeah, it's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> Fall him at the first fence. Oh! Eventually, they get the platform working. The next hurdle is to get the crates up one floor to the galleries, but the lift door won't close. There's an important decision to be made once the stones are assembled, ready to be unpacked. How should they be arranged? You usually, if you imagine <coughs> where everything is at the moment, it's just a, <coughs> just a question of juggling it around to suit. Because they are going to, I mean, it's not going to be like... The artist had given some guidelines, but the Tate don't need to stick to them. Try it more triangular. There is even a question as to whether we're using all of the, all of the elements, in fact. A week later, the piece has been installed. The tallest display space in the gallery now contains 31 stones, less than half a metre high. 
Now the pace hots up as more art is installed. This work by American artist Sol LeWitt takes up an entire wall. It's been created by the Tate's art handlers and they've been at it for a fortnight, drawing parallel lines according to very specific instructions from the artist. Like Joseph Boyce's stones, this is another work where the artist doesn't have to be around while the final appearance is created. In another room, the assembly begins of a large kinetic sculpture by Swiss artist Jean Tangely. As the galleries acquire their works of art, they'll also acquire some purpose-made benches designed by Herzog and de Meuron. But when the Tate first saw their initial designs, they weren't terribly happy with them. Now Sarota, Nitfer and Wilson visit Basel to sit on a prototype. If they don't like it, the Tate may commission someone else to design the benches. But in fact, when they see the real thing, they're happy with it. Pierre found it should. How it's about making it silver? <laughs> we are saying that we would like to have your benches in the galleries. Your and benches are our benches. And I would say if there's no need for us to go and look at any other source of benches, these are fantastic. Only three months before the gallery opens, the first benches arrive at Tate Modern for the team to see how they look alongside the art. Yeah. Then the question is now, um, no one wants it to be stained. Even I can't Peter. get it flat. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's the very dark Everyone's pleased with how it looks on its own, but Frances Morris hasn't been involved with the development of the bench design, and she's concerned about how it will look when it's placed in the midst of some of the Tate's art. I personally find it very difficult to see how this bench will work in the Rothko room in the Bacon Room, in a number of rooms where we were, are duty-bound to provide she, sh, seating, because I think it's a beautiful bench, but I don't think it's nearly neutral enough to have in gallery spaces. But was there really any danger of the bench being mistaken for a sculpture? Morris was convinced there was. Because I was in the gallery today and two art handling or technicians came in and said, could they move it? Was it a work of art? Mm. Yeah. Or was it a bench? Well, I, I don't want to lose it. I think it's important it should be in the show. Every day from January to March this year, the curators work their way at breakneck speed through room after room, making final decisions about the exact positions of works of art. That's not going to work. It's a tense time for the team. Media interest is mounting, and yet they don't want journalists to see the building until it's exactly the way they want it. Because I'm worried that too many people are walking through these rooms, seeing them in conditions in which we're not happy with them. We know we're going to make a change, but other people are seeing them in that condition. James Hall's written a piece about Tate Modern, where he talks about the walls not being properly finished and so on. He's obviously walked through the gallery, and some time ago. I don't know, but he has written it, is all I'm saying. Sarota has been a hands-on director throughout the design of the building. Now that it's time to finalise the art, it would be surprising if he held back. With the best of intentions, he can't resist rolling up his sleeves. Even at this late stage, there's some final measuring to make sure that a painting will fit. There are 84 galleries spread over four different suites, each with a different theme. One suite looks at how modern artists represent the human body, and today it's decision time for the first room in the suite, called The Naked and the Nude. Over the last year, the Tate curators have decided which pictures should go in the room. Now the group have to fix on the final layout. 
slows down the process tremendously. Where are the technicians? Since it is an opening room for a suite, it has to just work. And it has to work in an instant, in a sense, also. It has to have, have a punch. You have to believe in it when you come into the room, in a sense. It's about those things. Behind the choice of works was the Tate's desire to compare two different artistic approaches to the body. The formal studio pose, the nude, and the more psychologically charged portrayal, the naked. The most powerful work in the room is reclining nude by Picasso, but where should it be placed and how should the other pictures relate to it? It's a great painting to come into and see straight in your face when you come in because it catches you. On the other hand, it also sets the tone for the whole room. It's a bit of a problem that we have that it's only the Picasso that has this type of temperature. I think we need like a second work of that kind in, in the gallery. When it was alone, when it was the only Picasso in the room, it, it was the only one that had a sort of a that kind of wilder temperament and also the sort of wilder colours. And I think in a sense was first when we brought in the other Picasso, which is an earlier Marie Therese painting, but which has the same colours at least and the same sort of visual punch as Picasso is such an expert in, in delivering, uh, that you, there was an axis in the room that sort of balanced the room it's, and, and helped to structure it. And then you could build the two side walls. In the course of an hour, the two Picassos are moved in and out of the same positions ten times, while Sorota, Morris and Nitva try to see how the rest of the room will work around them. Now, um... By the way the pictures are juxtaposed, often painted by artists 50 or more years apart, the new arrangement should give insights that aren't possible with the traditional, strictly chronological layout. The Tate is almost ready to open on the day they said they would five years ago, May the 12th, and they've come in on budget too. Come on Harry, you're not supposed to be looking at the art. Now the two men whose daily lives have been most bound up with Tate Modern tour the finished museum. Peter Wilson and Harry Gugger, the client and the architect, still seem to be on good terms. Shall we have a game? <laughs> Stop playing. This one is specifically nice. <laughs> the one with the hole. <laughs> but to the last, Gugger is a perfectionist. It would be too much to expect that he'd be entirely pleased with what he sees as he tours the finished building. No, since my expectations are high, it's only matching my expectations and I'm not getting into the mood of being pleased. It's just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just what I expect, or I have to expect, I guess. It's always good to have high expectations. That, w that way you can always come away a bit disappointed, can't you? Yes, exactly. <laughs> the worst moment in a project always is when you are finishing it off, and then it takes about a year until you start to like it. It's, uh, if you have invested so much energy and, uh, and you never, you never, and I mean, it's, it's, it, it would be strange if you get where you want to. I mean, you would stop working, I guess. Uh, so you never get there. As three key figures in the construction phase look back at the project, they've nothing but praise for the Tate as a client. From a personal point of view, I think they have been an absolute joy to work with. They, they really have. The, the, the main conduit for that has been Peter Wilson, who's been fantastic, and uh, he, he deserves a lot of credit. I think Peter's role as a sort of a judicial father to us all is uh, very strong, but uh, I think he does his role incredibly well. This job is, you know, a testament to that guy. Uh, it's is it is one of the most positive, knowledgeable clients I've ever worked with. For many members of the team, their work is over, but Wilson's job continues. With barely time to take a breath, he now has to look after a brand new, fully functioning building with a whole new crop of quirks and problems. Cynthia's on the case. 
be sorting that out. Inevitably, you don't know everything there is to know about a building. Even a year in, there'll be lots of things that we still don't know about it. And typically, museum buildings go through a kind of initial adulation period when everyone thinks they're wonderful. And then after a while, the staff get tired of uh, the quirks. And uh, they, go, they go through a period when, when, when people are frustrated by them. And they learn to live with their, their quirks and then people are happy with them. Lars Schnitfer's job changes too. From waiting in the wings, he now steps onto centre stage and waits for the first visitors to pour through the doors. I think if someone walked through a number of galleries and they felt that it had touched them, if they came out and felt that this was really meaningful, I'd like to come back and, and I understand why people go to art museums and why people love art, that's great, I think. Over the last six years, the transformation of Bankside into Tate Modern has been driven by the ambition of one man, Nicholas Sorota. For him, the new museum gives the Tate a long-awaited competitive edge over the rest of the world. London has a lot of catching up to do. I mean, we are creating a great museum of modern art. 25 years behind Paris, 70 years behind New York, years behind Bill Bauer. Since we started planning this project, the Pompidou has renovated itself, added another whole floor of accommodation. The Museum of Modern Art in New York has embarked on a scheme that will add 50% of its exhibition space. Both of those projects have been stimulated partly by what we're doing here. But the real internal driver, I think, is what artists need and what we feel we need to show.